All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Board of Adjustment. Um, tonight we have the same five member boards that five members that we had here last week, and I'm going to call the Board of Adjustment to order. We have five members, so we have a full quorum. A couple of things before we begin this evening. Once again, um, please be courteous to to your neighbors and friends as we proceed this evening, and please. Um, Turn your cell phones off if you haven't done so already. And we, the Board of Adjustment cannot take any testimony from the back of the room. This is an evening for us to uh, discuss and, uh, and deliberate um, in public, in open session. And we will do so in, in we will, as we go through that, this this evening. We can't take any, any comments or testimony or outbursts from the back of the room. So please be patient with us. and. And we'll do our best to get through this this evening. And um, with that being said, I'm going to first turn it over to the planning department and let them give us a little intro of how we're going to conduct this this, this, this evening. And uh, I think we'll be able to get through it. Okay, Rick or Jeff? First of all, um, <clears throat> I mean, before we get started, if you have any questions of us, anything general, go ahead. But just talking to Lars just today and the standard procedure is to get a motion on the table. A motion and a second, it would be either to grant the appeal, which would also mean denying the conditional use permit, or a motion and a second to deny the appeal and grant the conditional use permit. That gets the discussion started. So, um, and Jeff was gonna talk a little bit about basis for approval, so I'll let him talk about that now. So it's really what I wanted to go through is just the uh, oh, there we go, it's uh, just the basis of approval. Um, so in approving a conditional use per a conditional use permit, the board shall determine that the proposed use at the proposed location will not be contrary to the public interest and will not be detrimental or injurious to the public health, public safety, or character of the surrounding area. To aid in the review of the proposed pod project against the previously stated criteria, the board shall evaluate the following specific criteria as applicable and shall, shall not be limited thereto. Uh, one, whether the proposed project will adversely affect property values in the area. Two, whether the proposed use is similar to other uses in the area. Three, whether the proposed project is consistent with the Door County Comprehensive and Farmland Preservation Plan or any officially adopted town plan. Four, provision of an approved sanitary waste disposal system. Five, provision for a potable water supply. Six, provisions for solid waste disposal. Seven, whether the proposed use creates noise, odor, or dust. Eight, provision of safe vehicular and pedestrian access. Nine, whether the proposed project adversely impacts neighborhood traffic flow and congestion. 10, adequate, adequacy of emergency services and their ability to service the site. 11, provision for proper surface drainage, proper surface water drainage. 12, whether, whether the proposed buildings contribute to visual harmony with existing buildings in the neighborhood, particularly as related to scale and design. 13, whether the proposed project creates excessive exterior lighting glare or spillover onto neighboring properties. And 14, whether the proposed project leads to a major change in the natural character of the area, the removal of natural vegetation or altering of the topography. Um, so just with that, this list of 14 criteria is not an exhaustive list. The 14 criteria is supposed to help you answer whether the use at the proposed location will not be contrary to the public interest and will not be detrimental or injurious to the public health, public safety, or character of the surrounding area. Okay. Any, uh, yes. Jeff, you, you had a third uh, question or category or whatever that's not on our, on our worksheet. We only have 13. Yeah. Right. So what was number three? Number three is whether the proposed project is consistent with the Door County Comprehensive and Farmland Preservation Plan or any officially adopted town plan. And, and that's actually a question on the, if you look up on top, it's a question. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, it's on the top of the page. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Pardon? It's a, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Rick or Jeff? Okay, thanks very much. Then I think if you heard um, Rick earlier, he said that what we need to do now is um, I'm looking for a motion either to um, gr um, grant the appeal um, and in essence deny the conditional use permit or deny the appeal and grant the conditional use permit. I'd like to um, like to get a motion and a second and then we would then we can get into discussion. So if somebody would like to entertain a motion. I make a motion that we deny the appeal. Okay, there's a motion by uh, Fred Fry to deny the appeal. Is there a second to that motion? So moved. Okay, uh, it's been seconded by John Young to deny the appeal. That just gets us to the, con to the ability to discuss this and go through that at this point. So we may have to come back, you know, if we don't reach a consensus, and we'll just have to see how this uh, proceeds, and correct? Dis discuss conditions and, uh, right. well, whatever you, else you need to discuss. Right, and, and, and I, think, I think the worksheets that the planning department gave us are extremely helpful. Um, I know a lot of, we have a great deal of notes, uh, so please refer to your notes. And uh, let's go through this methodically, um, one by one. And remember, we have a motion on the table to deny the appeal and, and grant the conditional use permit. So um, as we go through this, um, I think I'll refer to the conditional use uh, permit worksheet um, and once again reiterate some of the things that Jeff said. Um, to issue a conditional use permit, the Board of Adjustment must determine that the proposed use at the proposed location will not be contrary to the public interest and will not be detrimental or in injurious to the public health, public safety, or character of the surrounding area. And on the top of the worksheet, it says, is the proposed project consistent with the Door County Comprehensive Plan? And we have um, a yes, not applicable, or a no. Um, and I, I and I think that question is also the number three in the worksheet that, uh, or in the work, in the worksheet that Jeff was talking about earlier. Right. So uh, we can just skip over that and come back, and we'll come back to that one on number three in just a moment. And then we're going to go to the next question in, of our worksheet: Is the pro proposed project consistent with with an officially adopted town plan? So that's the first question. And I think you know those of us here on the board. Um, it, it's always been my policy to go through um, one by one like we've done in the past. And I think, uh, Fred, you offered the motion. Let's go to you first and we'll work it back this way. Um, is a proposed project consistent with the officially adopted town plan? Uh, I said yes. I mean, it, it, to me, going back to 2014 when the, uh, when the community put together their, their developmental plan, um, they established the core area. Um, I think the process was officially followed to uh, make the next steps accordingly to make this a, a um, commercial mixed-use zone piece of property. So okay. I think it was part of, the, part of their plan. And, and I did say yes as well. I, I want to uh, commend the Jacksonport Plan Commission and the Jacksonport Town Board for having those processes in place. Uh, I know that they spent um, years and working with the county on that as well and, and the planning department in order to create uh, an officially adopted town plan. So I think uh, from my vantage point, the record is clear in that regard that the proposed project appears to be consistent with an officially adopted town plan. I would agree with that as well from the questions that were answered in the uh, hearing. Okay. Monica? Uh, I said yes also in that um, the town um, added their um, consideration of what they wanted in their town to the Door County Comprehensive Plan when it was redone in 2014. So um, yes, they followed that procedure. Okay. Um, then the next... Uh, John gets the vote too. Oh, John. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. That's all right. Uh, I voted yes, and it is consistent, and it's part of the core that they have, and there's no place else to put it, so it is consistent. Okay. Um, then the next um, the next question at the top of the list deals with uh, with the public interest category. Uh, the question is: Will the proposed project enhance 
or sustained property values in the area. Fred, are you comfortable? At any time you want me to go back the other way, you say so. But okay. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. All right. Um, I, I don't know if it's permitted, but I actually answered uh, yes and no. I, I, I mean, I listened to the testimony um, on both sides of the issue, and I, and I don't think there's a, an answer that you can determine with any certainty. Um, I don't think there's um, substantial evidence from other campground neighborhoods that suggests that the values went down. Um, the the uh, story of the vacant property that went from 34000 as a listing price to 20000 given the, the chronology of when the $34,000 listing was and the ultimate sale and the lack of sale of other properties of similar makeup, I, I don't think you can conclude that that's the result of, of the campground being proposed. Um, you know, I made note of, of um, Mr. Nelson's study where the number three reason for diminishment of, of uh, property values was because of uh, rental properties. And I, you know, and I, I guess I looked up the definition of rental properties and I have my own view and I don't think that a campground necessarily, I think rental properties are people that rent a home or a condo or something for an extended period of time um, and I and I so I didn't conclude that campgrounds <coughs> fell under that rental property definition that supposedly causes a 14 percent decrease so I you know my answer to that is I I, I don't know I, I I don't I don't know the answer for sure but I I don't think that it necessarily means that the property values are going to go down um, I I too had uh, some difficulty with that one um, because I don't think either side um, brought in any expert witnesses that, that said that this project will um, enhance or decrease, decrease the property values in the immediate area. Um, one of the things that always troubles me with um, any type of development, um, and even, even a single family home for that matter, is that, um, it, that I, it's my opinion that um, projects um, are enhanced it, when the projects are finished. What happens is whether it's a home or whether it's a commercial project, that if the project is never finished or completed to as was presented, um, and granted there will be some times that those change plans need to be altered, but um, what we're dealing with what was presented to us, but uh, these things don't happen overnight. They don't get finished overnight, it takes some time. And um, with any project, everybody has to be patient, with whether it's a single family home or a commercial development. But I think the public is entitled to, and the immediate area is entitled to, um, see a finished project and can only go by what was presented. So I think in the, in, in the long run, I would hope that it would sustain property values. But I was interested in some of the discussion by property owners on Cape Point Drive and, and Lakeshore Drive that um, felt that, um, if I heard it correctly, that felt that if the increase in property value was a concern for the town from the campground's vantage point, there could possibly be a decrease in property value on Lakeshore Drive and Cave Point Drive. But I don't know if that's going to happen. And I know the town offered um, a letter, or, or I don't think it was just hearsay evidence from the town assessor. He wasn't the if you recall through our, our seminars with legal counsel in the past that, you know, whether it's a town official or, or a citizen offering the testimony of a, another person, if that person isn't here, it's really her, hearsay. So, with, and if I heard it correctly, was that he had a conversation with the local assessor and that property values would, would not decrease as much. But again, that perhaps is hearsay evidence. Uh, so I think a finished project would perhaps sustain the property values in the area, whether property values would increase or decrease, I think it's still still debatable. Bob? I had uh, not applicable because I, I'm not, never comfortable with discussions of property values because it's such a subjective thing uh, that's been used in many um, uh, zoning and, uh, and other situations. So I don't really feel it's, uh, it's something that I, I would take into consideration on this. Okay. Monica. 
I uh, agree with everyone so far. Um, I took advantage of the or in that sentence and uh, look at the sustained property values. Um, I think each property stands on its own merit for the most part. If you have a beautiful piece of property that's up for sale and somebody likes it, they will pay what you're asking if they really don't care one way or the other or in that kind of thing, the property value goes with that. So um, I would tend to think that this property itself will sustain its value. Uh, it should go up actually when you put improvements on it and assessors are supposed to look at improvements within the area when they reassess. So um, going from a farm field to an improved piece of property means generally the property value goes up. Okay. Mr. Young. I agree with that. Um, I put in A because I don't have a crystal ball, but I can look to see what's going to happen with property values at this point. Uh, I think time will, will tell to your point. And uh, I think that uh, you know, if you can fight, if you can vote yes and NA, I would do it that way. Okay. Um, then the next question um, deals with is the the question is is the proposed use similar to other uses in the area, Mr. Fry? Uh, I said yes. Um, I said in the scope of the immediate neighborhood, um, it, it's not similar to other uses. But if you view area as the wider landscape, I mean, typically you're not going to pile a campground on top of campground. So if you look at the wider geographical area, which is what I did, um, there are other campgrounds in the area and, and several that are not all that far away from this proposed site. Okay, um, I actually, um, I found the um, discussion on this to be very interesting uh, both ways, but in, when I came down to it, I, because both sides talked about campgrounds in the, in the area of Northern Door, and so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. And I, it's my belief that the other campgrounds in Northern Door um, are obviously extremely, most of them are extremely well run and extremely important to the economy in Northern Door. Um, there are two campgrounds that have this close proximity to the highway, one in the town of uh, Carlsville and one in the, bill of, or the town of Egg Harbor just outside, just to the north, it's the KOA campground. So both of them have very close highway access um, those two projects, are, I believe, are both in unzoned townships where all of the other campgrounds in Northern Door are in zoned townships. So I had to come down that, you know, to the fact that I sided more with the fact that they were dissimilar than similar because I had to throw the two, in my opinion, I had to, I had to completely disregard the two in the unzoned townships because I have to be of the belief that those two campgrounds would not have been constructed to the size that they were constructed had there been zoning. Whether true or not true could be an argue, argued point, but they're not necessarily germane. But since we're talking about similar uses in the other in the area, I'd say that in this case it's dissimilar because the other pro campgrounds are located away from the highway corridor. Bob? I also had no, um, for similar reasons, um, I think uh, if we look at the campgrounds in Bailey's Harbor, um, I think those are two that are pretty close to each other and have um, better, uh, seem to have better access uh, being not being on a, uh, on a major highway. Okay, Monica. Okay, um, I said yes um, because um, similar uses in, in Northern Door County, no matter where you are, this would be appropriate use. Um, if the other conditions are appropriate, um, the access is not directly from the highway. So, um, so I sort of disagree a little bit with um, the other two on that deal. And I think um, the proposal was to work um, to make it as safe as possible there um, by not using the highway for the entrance. Okay, John. I said yes, and basically what you said, 
I, I used uh, Bailey's Harbor, which had two campgrounds on two highways. And, uh, you know, it's sort of darned if you do and darned if you don't, because how do you, how do you access something like that? I mean, it's a tough one. Okay. All right. Okay, the next, uh, the next section deals with um, health and the, well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to, um, is the proposed project consistent with the Door County Comprehensive Plan? Because that was in, in Jeff's preamble. Right. So, okay, so that would be number, in essence, number three. So, once again, is the proposed project consistent with the Door County Comprehensive Plan? Mr. And I said yes. Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah, I, and I and I and I said I, I said yes as well. Um, I, I think that the comprehensive plan for for this area uh, was quite clear and has been worked on for a long time. And I think it would be hard to argue against that it's not consistent with the Door County comprehensive plan. Bob, I agree as well. I think the planning department's done a good job of uh, making sure that everything's in uh, in place here for that. Um, Monica. Bob, can you, can you just pull your mic up just a little closer? Thanks. Um, okay, I agree it's consistent with the Door County Comprehensive Plan, and I forgot to mention earlier, too, that it's also consistent with a future land use map, okay. which the state requires. Right. Okay. I said yes, too, to the same points that you all made. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question deals with health. That question is, has provision been made for an approved sanitary waste disposable system? Mr. Fry. And I said yes. I mean, I, I, I am not an expert in this area, but from everything that, that Pete presented, and uh, to me, they've not only uh, complied with the specifications, but exceeded the, the all regulations, and it seems to be a, a very much a state-of-the-art uh, waste disposal system. Yeah, I, I said um, yes as well. I think the testimony by Pete Hirth uh, from Bodwin, um, there was no testimony, uh, no expert testimony in opposition. Uh, there was people that came to the table and testified that they were, you know, concerned. And I, and I appreciate and understand the concern. Uh, but if you're going to come forward, you need to bring an expert witness that's going to dispute what the expert witness from the other side brought to the table. Yeah, and, so, I, yeah, and, and so I thought um, uh, Mr. Hearth and Baldwin, uh, in, in my tenure here, was one of the best laid out plans that I've ever seen. We don't typically deal with them because the checks and balances in the planning department, the, the, the building permit can't be issued unless the sanitarian, uh, Door County Sanitarian signs off. And so there are checks and balances that are built in for uh, all sides. And I, and I meant to mention too that there was no evidence of other longer existing campgrounds, which I assume had less technologically advanced uh, systems of having any issues with well water or, or contamination. It's a, that's a good point. And, and I think the planning department also um, was able to bring it to our attention that there's only one campground, I believe, in Northern Door that's served by, uh, currently served by sewer. There are two in Bailey's both, Harbor. Both Bailey's, both Bailey's, Harbor. Bailey's Woods and Bean Town are served by uh, private on-site wastewater systems. Okay. Um, Bailey's Grove is served by enti entirely by sewer. Right. Got it. Okay. In that regard. Yep. Okay. Bob? Um, I had uh, yes as well for that, although I still have a concern about some of the chemicals that are used um, uh -huh. in these um, holding tanks on the RVs. Um, just a general. Um, Lack of really, uh, I mean, in my opinion, um, uh, investigation of uh, any chemicals that are being used these days, and especially something that's going to be in a, in a uh, uh, um, grade uh, septic system. You don't know what's going to get through the, the uh, system down to the, uh, the water table. So that's always been a concern of mine. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think, you know, I too. Um, uh, we heard a great deal of testimony in regard to the chemicals and even uh, from the standpoint of uh, Bodwin even acknowledging that perhaps there we just don't know and um, certainly we heard testimony and I think uh, those of us that um, even googled it um, there are other 
there are other countries that do a much better job than what we do, but there aren't any laws regulating, per se, what those chemicals are. And I think, unfortunately, it's beyond our scope at this point. Monica? Um, thank you. Agree with both of you. Um, also want to note that um, Odwin Incorporated has a reputation for best practices throughout the state, not just in Door County. And also, um, projects like these have even more oversight um, by government than our individual home septic and uh, sanitary systems. So we're, when a project like this is done according to best practices, we're in better shape for clean water and um, groundwater, et cetera, than we are with you or I putting in our own septic systems. John? Oh, this was a tough one for me, being my background, but anyhow. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with yes, but I'm going to have some pr provisions for safety backup uh, for a generator that I'm going to propose later on. Okay. Just so that that doesn't become a problem. Okay. Um, and then the next question deals, is the question is, has provision uh, been made for a potable water supply? Right? Yes. Yeah, it, there's, again, we have checks and balances built into the planning department and, um, and nothing can be issued correct with, a building permit can't be issued without a safe potable water supply. That's correct. They so. would need to have safe potable water. Okay. I guess as well. Yes, also. Yes, but I, I have a question. Has there been any uh, testing on that? or anything uh, in the way of a written as far as is drillable? I can't answer that. I don't know. But I know that they're, they're state regulated. And if a well's installed, it'll have to be approved by the state. Right. I understand. And I, it's coming out of Lake Michigan anyhow, if you go down however deep they have to go. Not really. It's all precipitation. Have you talked to a well driller lately? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, do. All right. Just call Euclid. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question uh, is: Has provision been made for solid waste disposal? Fred? Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't think there's any question here in regard to solid waste disposal. Uh, I, you know, I think we're very fortunate, and we take a lot of that for granted all over the county and, and all the solid waste companies do a marvelous job for us and uh, so I think yeah, I, I have no difficulty with this that one at all as well for me and me I'll go along with uh, that yes okay um, the next question is, has provision been made to control noise, odor, and dust? Fred. And I said yes. I mean, there was, uh, this was one where there was a lot of testimony and conjecture about all of that. I, I, to me, the, the dust one, um, the plan to put the kind of material down, it's not going to be a, a dirt road. I, I mean, I hope, uh, again, part of my... Uh, assumptions on a lot of these things is I believe the the uh, owners are very responsible people and I believe if there is dust that comes up because of extremely dry weather they'll find a way to wet it down so I have some level of, of I guess trust that that will happen um, odor um, again I, I, I guess I have to be there but I, I assume there will be some campfire smokes but but there's regulations, the, the conditions require that they be extinguished by a certain time of night. And, you know, and I, uh, frankly, I mean, I don't live near a campground, but I walk down the road and all my neighbors have got fires in the fireplace. I smell smoke all the time. It's not necessarily an offensive smell. It's, you know, it's not like a, a garbage dump. So, I mean, I, I, I think you're going to smell some of that, but I, I don't find that to be something that's going to chase people in, in the house. And then the other one is the, the noise. And, and, I mean, there's reasonable noise anywhere. I mean, I'm working outside today, there are chainsaws, all kinds of noise going on. That's part of living anywhere. Uh, I, I think the concern uh, of the, the people appealing is that we're going to have dogs barking and 
children yelling and screaming and, and loud music and and it's I'm not a camper but I I, I mean I I think people that go camping have a certain sense of responsibility, and they, and I think the other campers that go there to be with their families and enjoy camping, if somebody gets out of line, you know, they're going to quiet it down, and the owners have testified that they're going to have 24 by 7 um, coverage, and if somebody is going outside the spirit of, of the noise, pollution, or whatever you want to call it, um, that they'll act on it, and if necessary, ask them to leave, because they want responsible people to come back and I understand that. I mean I, my view my view of campers is almost completely different than what a lot of the appellants have portrayed in their and how they've you know put a composite together of campers so um, I, I think I think it will there will be some noise but not necessarily unreasonable and if there is I believe it will be policed and dealt with yeah, I, I too um, had to come down on yes on that one as well. I think, you know, best man management practices will uh, control, and that's the main question here, um, to, uh, to control the noise, odor, and dust. And one of the nice things about um, having this case heard uh, before Jackson Court Plan Commission and Jackson Court Town Board and the Resource Planning Committee is that you know we we have some conditions that we can establish and I think some of the conditions that are very similar to most campgrounds where there's a 10 p.m. curfew and uh, that fire is being extinguished by by midnight are important conditions and I think best management practices will see to it that those are enforced I think that you know obviously if you have gravel driveways and things of that sort in a campground area, again, best management practices will make sure that on those hot, dry summer days that we have, that they'll, they'll probably be watered down like other campgrounds are as well. Um, there will be times that there will be dust. There's no question about that. There will be times that there will be, that there will be odor. There will be times that there will be noise. But the, the key is whether that it can be controlled. So I think it, the answer is yes. Bob? I have a yes as well. Uh, I think the odor and the dust uh, were, uh, were adequately addressed. Um, I think the dust would be more of a problem for them up there than it would be for any of the neighbors. Uh, I'm sure they would want to do something about that. Um, I do have a little concern about noise. I, it's a tough one to uh, really control and um, the fact that it's a, kind of an open space um, might uh, lend itself more towards people that are going to be hanging around their trailers uh, as opposed to going into the woods um, or you know, uh, something more more nature oriented. Um, so I, I, do, I do have that concern about noise, uh, how well that, that'll be able to be controlled. Um, but I think they, it, 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 they have some provisions in place to, uh, to uh, try and control it. Okay, Monica. Uh, I agree with Fred and Lars, but also would like to add that the more trees there are, the more it will mitigate all three of those, noise, or odor, and dust. Um, someone um, of the appellants mentioned that in, in a letter, I don't think it was in testimony here, um, about noise bouncing off the trees. Well, just from my own experience, when the neighbors took down all of their trees, the first thing I heard when I came home was more noise. So we put up a little orchard and we put a row of trees around our perimeter, much more quiet. The trees do a lot of good. So as part of the conditions, I think I will be um, strongly advocating for lots of trees, um, both um, at the perimeter of the property as well as within the property for, to control the, all three of those things. I, I really appreciate that and I, and I too will be echoing that as we get into conditions. Thank you. Okay, this is a tough one since I've been very involved for a number of years on uh, dusty roads. Water does not do it, but water evaporates like you can put it down this morning and come noon. It's history. But there is a product out there that we came across, I don't know the name of it, but you put it down probably twice in the course of the summer, sometimes once. and, and it, Proof of putting on that uh, sigh that has uh, hands on turn turn blood right thank you uh, he's put that on his probably close to two thousand foot driveway 
there's nothing there all summer long. So I'm going to say that that's a condition I will put on there that other than oil, because nobody wants oil, that, that's, that's terrible. It does a good job, but it's terrible. Uh, but this product, and it's not that expensive, that be used, and then I've got a yes. If not, I have a no. Okay, fair enough. Okay, the next question um, deals with safety. Um, the question is, has adequate provision been, been made for safe vehicular and pedestrian access? Mr. Fry. Uh, I had no, I guess I would call it a provisional no. Um, you know, I, I, I believe we need to put some conditions on to explore making it safer at the same time. And we had testimony that, that you know, on the one side we had people saying there are going to be copious amounts of accidents, and yet we saw from the testimony that the Door County Sheriff's Department uh, said there have been no accidents with a, within a thousand feet of that intersection other than deer strikes. Um, I, I drove up there over the weekend and to me there was, there's ample line of sight from both approaches to that intersection. You know, the fire department, uh, they've affirmed that they have easy access um, to the road. Um, and, you know, and again, I'm trying to portray how this is going to play out and we have, let's say we have 130 people coming to that campground, they're not all going to arrive on the same day at the same time. So I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get away from this picture of a wildly congested intersection where people can't get on or off of the, off of the roadway. At the same, th same time, I think that the, there needs to be some further exploration done on possibly reducing the speed limit through that zone. Um, that certainly squaring off the, the intersection at Bagnall and 57 would be appropriate. And, uh, you know, and I'd like to see the town um, work on extending the walkways. Uh, again, I don't see, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think most of us are parents and I can't see, especially if, if the owners of the campground provide the safest and probably the most um, enjoyable route to either walk or bike to town that, that parents are going to let their children loose on bikes or, or on a two foot wide shoulder going down the hill on Highway 57. I, I mean, I, I, just, I just don't see it. So I, I think there's, there needs to be something more f formal done to ensure that we're making this the safest possible intersection and, and path to town as possible. But um, that's, my, that's, that's part of my conditions that I would, would add when we get to the final stages. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I share all the concerns that you share, and even more so. Um, I, I do think, I mean, I travel this road um, probably more than, than any one of us board members. Uh, that's the way I consistently come to Sturgeon Bay. Um, it, and um, I do know that the speed limit signs uh, have, the speed limit flashing signs have helped, and I commend the town for that, but I, I really, um, is I really disappointed that that the that the Jacksonport Plan Commission and the Jacksonport Town Board didn't tackle this issue before it got to conditional use right. because I think we're way ahead of ourselves and we're going to be asking the DOT to come in and do something and and correct something when the, there was ample opportunity to deal with this at an earlier stage and for this board now to deal with it, I think it's going to be difficult. Um, there was a great deal of testimony from both the opponents and even the town that um, sidewalks and improvements to this site are, some, some are perhaps planned, and I think someone offered that's a pie in the sky type of analogy, and I would concur with that at this point. I don't think there's anything out there that shows me that there's going to be any type of improvement in that immediate area. And, um, and, uh, and the interesting thing is, as you drive from Sister Bay to Sturgeon Bay, and um, there are numerous, numerous uh, turn lanes from Sister Bay, I think from Sister Bay to Bailey's Harbor, uh, there's one intersection 
the one area that has a turn has a turn lane, and there are seven wide curb areas where the entrance onto the uh, town road or county road um, that actually the state or the town or whoever paid for it actually have curbs, cement curbs, and they're wider than rather that straight in ingress egress coming onto the highway. So that so that it was easier to do that from Bailey's Harbor to Jacksonport. Um, I counted four turn lanes, and three are at Kangaroo Lake, um, if you're making a turn lane onto Kangaroo Lake. Uh, and there you also, in that area, you have um, one curb uh, area where that has wide turns again. You have uh, wider paved shoulders even at the wayside between Bailey's Harbor and Jacksonport for people to ingress, egress safely out in and out of the, out of the wayside. Um, and then Loggerquist Road, which is a mile and a half approximately away from uh, the, to the north of this site, there's a turn lane there that accesses uh, uh, over to the Kangaroo Lake area. Um, and then from Jacksonport to Sturgeon Bay, I counted two turn lanes and one um, curb area with wider turns that the county, I think, put in those curbs again. And then even at the farm in, in Sturgeon Bay, the very popular farm, has a wider area for people to pull ingress and egress up in and out of. So I think, you know, at this point, um, the applicant, you know, I think it's the applicant's duty to bring that information to the board that, you know, shows this board and shows other boards that we plan on a safe ingress, egress out of there. We don't have anything from the DOT saying that it's not safe, but we don't have anything from the DOT saying that it is safe. And with you have 130 uh, campsites coming in there, or you know, people coming into those campsites on Memorial Day weekend, um, and like Fred said, with people, you know, uh, pedestrian traffic into town. I, I know there's other access points to come into town, but people always want to go to. It's like when you lay out a lay out sidewalks at a university or at a school. Um, I always say you should watch where the pedestrian traffic is because if you put the sidewalks in first you know, it's not necessarily where people are going to walk. So I think it's important that more study is done on that. And I just don't think, I, I just can't imagine that that is going to be a safe area because I know when you are southbound, even leaving Jacksonport, uh, once again, I will reiterate that those signs help, but people testified at this board that as you're leaving Jacksonport from the south, you want to get going. That 55, it goes from 30 to 55 almost as you're, you're leaving Jacksonport. And Fred indicated, in testimony indicated, that that should perhaps be extended further. And the reason it's even more disappointing to me is that the town actually owns a little bit of cord, a little bit of land in that area to help, help uh, alleviate that situation. And I think that needs to be brought to this board first and foremost, or any other board uh, before, the, before we could issue approval. And I guess in the spirit of discussion, I, I mean, I think in, we're in agreement that something needs to be done and something, I mean, look at what's going on there, but at the same time, I mean, traffic egress is part of Door County life. I mean, if I, if I go up to, you know, get to Penn Players when they let out, get to Fish Creek when you're trying to make the turn on 42 and people come the other direction, to, you know, you can go all the way up the peninsula, go up to the to the theater, go up to Al Johnson's. People coming out the back end trying to get on there. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of traffic going on, and you can't you just can't avoid. It. I mean, we're a busy place, especially in the summer. So I mean, I I'm in total agreement with you that we there's something needs to be looked at to try to improve the conditions. But I, you know, I don't think you can just say, well, we can't have any difficult intersections. There's all kinds of difficult intersections going on in Door County right now. Sure. No, I and and I and I think you know I, I don't want to compound the problem. Yeah. That's what I'm saying until I know uh, that the, if the DOT is in front of this board and say you know, we don't think it is a problem, then I can't just I can't just assume their mere the mere fact that they're not here to offer testimony that means that it's not a problem. Bob, I have no as well for uh, similar reasons that uh, Lars just mentioned. Um, that's been one of my biggest concerns uh, after I, after thinking from the, the testimony that we've had here. Um, and I think um, it, it kind of falls to the town to uh, put um, some of this stuff in 
ideally have it all done before this project is even started, have walking paths, um, have uh, the, the uh, speed limit, uh, uh, the 30 mile an hour speed limit <coughs> extended past this intersection. Um, these people, these are going to be people that are, uh, probably a lot of them are going to come up to door for the first time. You know, that's that's what happens. That's how I first came up. I, when I first came to visit, it was at a campground. Um, so they're not going to be aware of the highways as much as we are, and they're going to be close to a small town like Jackson Port. So there, there's going to be people walking down the highway as far as I can see. Uh, and I, I don't think that's a safe situation. Monica. Okay, I'm going to disagree with you guys. Um, I, I give a lot more credit to people who come to visit Door County. They know they're coming to the top tourist <coughs> place in all of Wisconsin. Um, I, yes, it's a busy road. I've driven on it um, for 10 summers, all times of day and night, with heavy duty equipment. People do watch out for each other. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, whoops now and then, or you know that kind of thing, or people blowing their horns and what have you at people. But you know you have to give people some credit for common sense. And um, while I I do think this is um, an unusual excuse me unusually um, constructed. Um, piece of the highway. Um, they went with the land when, when they first put it in and haven't changed much. Doesn't mean I don't think they could improve it, but I don't think it is the duty of the owners of that property um, to uh, wait uh, or change or make changes. Yes, they can underscore and support what the town asks for as far as changes, but I don't think that should be a condition for this particular campground because it's not it's not part of, of what they um, are required to do. Um, also, um, the walking and all of that kind of thing, again, um, I think this means that within the campground, they're making provisions for movement, safe movement around the campground, and what people do when they leave the campgrounds is you can tell them about where things are, you can tell them it's a busy highway, but I, I, I just don't think that people who come camping are ignorant of those kinds of things. Okay, thanks Monica. John? I agree with what you all have said because safety is the most important issue. I know the, uh, the economics of things, when you get into large development like this, there's always surprises, but there's also lawsuits. And I think that as a board member, I owe it to the developer to protect them as best as we can by imposing these safety rules of acceleration, deacceleration, passing, because that's not a 25 mile an hour zone. It never will be, well I should never say that. But, uh, that's a 55 mile an hour zone. Even if they get down to 45, are they going to be going 45? No. But I say no until I'm shown how that can be met because Highway 42 at Little Sweden, we had to put that all in ourselves. DOT said our job is to move traffic, not slow it down. And I said, well, isn't that nice? And how many people are you going to kill along the way? And those kinds of things happen. When we put that in, sure, it's very expensive. But you know what? We haven't had one accident in all these years. And that, that project's no different than what's on 57. Because it's 55 miles an hour. 55 miles an hour. OK. And John, if. Um I mean, I get the spirit of what you're saying, and I, I agree with that, but if you're suggesting that you're trying to protect the campground owners from potential liability, I mean, we're now kind of getting into I, my... I, I understand that. Yeah, I understand I mean, that. They're, 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 but you've got to look that. Well, I, I understand. look into the future, because all it takes is one big accident, one big lawsuit. Yeah, but I don't... Well, I don't think you're going to... The, the campground's not going to be liable for that. That's... That, they're not... That they're not taking any action to cause... Well, you're the insurance executive. Yeah, well, I, yeah, and I just don't say... I, I don't see even the most liberal of juries coming to that conclusion and making connecting those dots. So that's just my again, just my opinion. I, oh, that's right. I appreciate it. 
Okay. Um, the next question is, have provisions been made to ensure the proposed project will not adversely impact neighborhood traffic flow and congestion? Fred. Well, I guess this was another of my uh, yes and no, or, or based on the other people using not, not applicable, one, one of those two options because, um, you know, I, I, I think there's the possibility, and I, but I think that's where getting the DOT involved to try to study and come to some conclusions is appropriate. So I, I'm not equipped to answer the question. It's certainly, again, it's a possibility, but I think we need to have uh, you know, experts in this area take a look at it. Yeah, I, again, um, you know, I, I, I said currently it's no. Um, there were some conditions that were attached to the original permit, and there was a great deal of testimony as people would leave the campground and there would be signage um, put in place that would, that would suggest that people would not make left-hand turns leaving the uh, campground so that they would have to turn right on Bagnell Road and then uh, head out to either Jorns Road or continue on Bagnell or turn, uh, turn right on Jorns Road uh, to go back into Bailey's Harbor or turn left on ba uh, Jorns Road to get back out to the highway. Um, uh, <coughs> you know, part of, me, part of me wishes that there wasn't ingress egress off of the highway from Bagnell Road, to be honest. I think this project would be safer if the Bagnell Road onto the highway didn't exist, but maybe I'm completely wrong on that. But I think, um, you know, obviously there's going to be, uh, with any type of campground, there's going to be signage, and uh, hopefully um, that will help alleviate some of the uh, traffic flow and the congestion. But I do know that, you know, when campgrounds are, are coming and campgrounds are going, you're going to have that type of congestion. Uh, what, what type of it, if, it, if that's negative, I, I just, don't know. Um, I, uh, I think Bob made a point earlier that people coming to this type of campground may be coming for the first time to Door County, so there will be some confusion. Um, so signage definitely will help, uh, but I don't know if it'll uh, alleviate all the, uh, the, the traffic flow and the, and the congestion. Bob? I had no as well. Um, I don't recall anything uh, that came up in testimony uh, from the uh, applicants for the CUP that talked about um, how they would um, uh, try to uh, mediate the effect of traffic flow, and I, I don't think there's anything they can really do. I mean, uh, they can do some suggesting, I guess, to some of the people leaving, but they have no control over where people go once they leave the campground. Monica? I have no additional comments. Okay. Uh, no, for the same reasons you all said. Okay. The next question, is there adequate access for emergency, service, uh, emergency services to service the site? Fred. Uh, I said yes. I think we had testimony, I believe it was from Tim Bly, and the, the fire department feels there is uh, very adequate access to the campground as needed. Yeah, I, I said yes as well. I think we're very fortunate uh, to have the uh, emergency services that we have in, in Door County, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Bly offered testimony that he, they felt comfortable that they would have uh, adequate access for emergency services to this site. Bob? I have a yes as well. Monica? Yes, yes also. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, has adequate provision been made for proper surface water drainage? Fred? Uh, I said yes to this one as well. Um, part of the Baldwin plan included the the provisions for um, surface water drainage. I mean, there was a, a lot of testimony that we heard from the appellants suggesting the water is going to go all the way down the hill. I heard some that where the, the ditches are going to be filled to overflowing. And again, I I drove up this weekend, and we had the last few days of the week we had a lot of melting, and and I didn't see the you know, the ditches were not overflowing with water. There, in most places, I didn't see any visible at all. Um, so I, I, I guess it's potentially possible if we have a huge rainstorm or something, but I don't see it as an ongoing problem. I think they've made adequate provisions to take care of that. Yeah, um, I would concur. I think, you know, um, uh, Mr. Hurth from Bodwin, um, certainly he was the expert that the applicants hired and there was no other testimony that dis uh, expert testimony that disputed um, their disputed his claims and uh, the layout that uh, they submitted 
it certainly is hard to hard to um, argue that that won't work. And I was pleased to see the retention ponds in there, and even pleased to see the swimming pond in there because I think that will uh, will help the whole project. Uh, I have yes as well. Um, I, w I was happy to see the uh, retaining pond and the uh, berm that uh, uh, Pete had shown us in the, in the drawing. So I think that will alleviate any, any um, concerns about any surface water. Okay. Monica? I concur with everyone so far. Okay. I said that <coughs> and no, when they have the meeting with the DOT, take up the issue of the flooding that continuously happens on Highway 57 <coughs> because that's never been addressed by the DOT. I shouldn't say never, but it, it's still a problem, and it's a serious problem from the testimonies that we heard. Okay. Uh, the next question deals with character of the character of the area. Uh, will the proposed building buildings uh, contribute to visual harmony with existing buildings in the neighborhood, particularly as related to scale and design? Mr. Fry. Uh, I answered not applicable. Um, I don't know that you can judge campground against other buildings existing in the neighborhood. Uh, well, what I looked at is if you look at the, the, the town's intentions um, to develop this core area, um, we already have a mixed-use commercial site, so if it's not a campground, it could be another commercial site, so I think there's going to be additions of buildings in that area that are not consistent with what's there now, but it's part of their plan to develop a commercial core. Yeah, I, I concur with you. Um, it maybe is not um, germane here, um, but you know, a couple of things. I mean, I like the proposed building that they had uh, to service the, the campground. I think that is in keeping um, with visual harmony in the, in the area. Um, and certainly as it's related to scale and design, um, it's, you don't have multiple buildings, but you know, it's a tough one for me because I offer testimony that I thought it's important to have additional buildings because you're going to need to have a need for storage, uh, those type of buildings. I don't see any of that yet, and, and I can assure you those things will come. They will come. They will come. <laughs> additional buildings will come. And uh, the other thing that, you know, frustrates me a little bit is, you know, I appreciate the fact that they own the neighboring property and I appreciate the fact that they offer testimony that they plan on building a house. I guess in a perfect type of campground setting, I would rather have the owners on premise because if you are, event, we're, 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 we're giving, we're potentially giving the permit to um, the owners and the property, but long term it's going to the property. And so I would rather have the, the owners or the managers on site. And I don't know that having them live in a campground or living in a trailer on site is the best possible way. Um, although they said they're going to be living um, on a separate parcel, but what happens when the day comes when the property is sold or moved on to another and we're not here and there's, it'll be somebody else's problem. So I just wanted to say that for this point, but I, 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 at the moment I'm okay with that. I had not, not applicable. Um, I, I don't think there's anything to really uh, compare it to uh, that's in the area right now. So, Okay, Monica? Well, I thought it looked a lot like the uh, horse barn across the field, and I didn't think it was that much different from the farm buildings down at Burnshines or going down Bagno Road, so I put yes. Okay, thanks. John? And I struggle with that one, but when I heard the testimony that uh, on their property, they're going to also have some horses, and so to be able to live in the the uh, RV center area and then have horses, that's not going to work in the, in the same area. So I can see why they would like to keep that separate. I'm going to vote yes, but uh, I think that, that that personally can be worked out. Sure. Especially if they resell it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, Will the proposed project uh, project protect against excessive exterior lighting glare or spillover onto the neighboring properties? Fred, uh, I answered yes. Um, it is uh, condition number two of the RPC's approval that um, that I would continue that that 
um, defines the kind of lighting that can be used. And uh, we also heard testimony that the owners of the campground don't intend to have a lot of high glare lighting for the comfort and, and uh, appreciation of the campers who don't want to be in a highly lit up area. Yeah, I, I think the condition number two, again, um, from the RPC was very important. Um, although, you know, these are tough ones for me because I think, you know, I as a commercial property owner, there are times that I wish I had less lighting than, than need be because I'm always concerned about the spillover on the neighboring property owners. Uh, the advancement of lighting uh, technology has really helped. Uh, in that regard, but I know other developments uh, throughout the county continue to struggle with that. Neighbors continue to complain about uh, excessive lighting and ex excessive spillover, um, and uh, that's a condition that shouldn't be just taken for granted. There should be some time and discussion on that, but I think uh, the RPC did a good job on that, but I know it, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult one to, to, to really come to terms with. Bob? I have a yes as well. Um, I think uh, this board and our RBC both have done a real good <coughs> job with making sure that uh, there isn't excessive exterior lighting these days. Uh, dark skies is, uh, I think, um, uh, something that uh, a lot of people, most people in the county appreciate, uh, both to see the stars and just to not have uh, anything glowing in the, uh, on the horizon after a sunset. Okay. Monica? I have nothing new to add. Okay. Scott? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the last question uh, is, will the proposed project, uh, project protect the natural character of the area and retain natural vegetation and topography? Fred? And I answered yes. Um, I mean, there's really not much to uh, protect what's there. It's a farm field. It's empty. There's nothing there. So, I mean, we're, as we get through the plans, um, We've already talked about that we're going to look at, at uh, significant planting of trees on the borders and um, and the owners have said they have a fairly extensive landscaping plan that will introduce some other trees and, and, and vegetation which if anything to me should enhance the, the property. Thanks. Um, I think there's some ways that we can deal with this question uh, with conditions. It's interesting. I think it was planning department staff that even mentioned in testimony that the development, maybe it wasn't planning departments, but it was mentioned, um, uh, it dealt with the development that was once known as Thumb Fun in Northern Door, where berms were created around the exterior and then trees were planted. And as I was driving to Sturgeon Bay this evening, um, and I, for the last couple of weeks, people have been asking me because they know I have, you know, that I, that I serve on this board, have been asking me about uh, um, all the soil that had been pushed up. Um, I'm not sure what county road that is when you turn to go to Kurt's Corral, and there's a farm on the highway in that oh, corner. Yeah, I, uh, I thank you, and and T T T. And um, I couldn't figure out what the berm was there for. Well, when I drove there tonight, there was eight to 10 foot cedar trees or type of trees planted on top of the berm all the way around the perimeter of the property. And I thought, well, that makes sense. I have no idea what the planned development is, but you know, there's, but those trees are not two foot trees for sure, what the ordinance calls for. So I think you know, some discussion about that is gonna be necessary um, as we proceed. Bob? Uh, I have a yes as well. I think um, they, uh, they talked about the vegetation that they plan on, on uh, planting there. I agree with Lars. We should uh, maybe take a closer look at that uh, with possible conditions. I said yes as well. Yes. With conditions. With conditions. With conditions. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think um, at this point then, um, I'm looking to planning department staff for advice. Um, are we going to work on conditions at this point, or do we? Um, I think we need to vote. Do we um, need to vote first, yeah, and then, you would, and then you because would it'd be silly to go through the conditions. Well, no. Yeah, I think we would vote on it, and then conditions first. And then yeah, you do the conditions first. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's hard to vote unless you know what the conditions are. You have to know what the conditions are first. Okay. There's something I... Now, um, 
I just wanted to read Jeff was talking about basis for approval and before you get into that the paragraph C after the 14 points now this comes right out of the ordinance it says the ap applicants failure to satisfy the criteria listed in the paragraph B which you were just talking about or any other applicable requirement in this ordinance may be deemed grounds to deny the conditional use permit uh, at all times the burden of proof to demonstrate satisfaction of these criteria remains with the applicant and you you're already aware that your concerns may be dealt with by conditions um, let me let me also um, offer this uh, when we dealt with um, previous appeals and when they came from appeals from resource planning committee or zoning administrators and we had the, the privy of having conditions uh, attached to the uh, previous uh, conditional use permit especially when it was on an approval situation this board has historically um, uh, adopted those conditions and then added to the conditions when and if necessary so it would be my suggestion uh, unless Rick or Jeff you feel differently that I certainly feel that the conditions that the resource planning committee established on this project were necessary and uh, and they could be they should be also included as we move forward Absolutely. Uh, um, so then we can add to that but I don't think that there's anything that we would need to take away from that that's that entirely up to the board I mean that would be my suggestion I would say uh, you know um, I would like to you know have some direction from this board uh, you perhaps would it be appropriate for me to ask for a motion on that uh, to adopt the conditions that the RPC established and then we can then we can also deal with uh, additional conditions I don't think you need a motion okay we can I can just request that and, and if unless there's anybody objects yeah, if you have if, if I any objection from any other board member okay so those conditions those those um, those 16 conditions that the resource planning committee established on uh, for this project be included as a part of a basis for approval based on the motion that was initially made by Mr. Fry and Mr. Young. And so, as per uh, Door County's Land Use Service Department zoning letter dated January the 22nd. Okay. Would, so you, would, you, would you like me to read through those ju conditions just uh, so we have yes. them? Yeah. Can you just yes. put them up right here? I can put them up on the Yeah. Just yeah, but I think it's important that we can have them up there or, or we have it in our Zooms. And if you, let's just go, why don't you read them off? So just going through here, I can, I can read them off. Yep, quickly. Um, so the first condition was a regular zoning permit for the buildings shall be suit shall be secured within 12 months of issuance of the conditional use permit. Construction must begin within 12 months of issuance of the regular zoning permit. Uh, condition number two, any outdoor lighting erected in conjunction with this use shall utilize fixtures whose lens, hood, or combination thereof allow no direct beams to be seen from off the property or cast skyward, and the lighting elements of which shall not be visible from adjacent properties. Uh, this condition also applies to the planned solar lights for the individual campsites. Jeff, uh, when we're talking about visible from the uh, outside of the property, that's from the property line. With this, uh, with this condition, it's a it's a canned condition that that would gets put on all conditional use permits that do get approved <coughs> at the resource planning committee level. Uh, what we are looking at, how we interpret this condition and enforce this condition, is basically that they need to be completely hooded where the hood goes to at least they need to be downlit and then the hood needs to go at least to the bottom of that lighting element um, so basically if you're standing from off that property of course you'll see light beams coming down but you won't be able to see the actual bulb right. um, from off the property okay thanks Condition number three is all applicable slate local state and federal building codes and ordinances shall be adhered to condition number four there shall be an on-site attendant 24 hours per day, seven days per week, whenever the campground is open. Condition number five, there shall be no more than 130 campsites within the, camp within the campground. Condition number six, 
a 10 p.m. curfew shall be required and all fires shall be extinguished by 12 a.m. Condition number seven, there shall be no exterior amplified sound from 10 p.m. to daylight. Condition number eight, no fireworks shall be used within the campground. Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see that if, if I have a family, I've got small kids and they're in bed and somebody starts blowing off fireworks, I'm going to complain to the manager and I'm going to stop it. I understand that. Yeah. Because you're not, I mean, doesn't, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a condition that if you complain to the planning department on a Saturday or Sunday, nothing, I mean, nothing's <laughs> going to get done, but it's a management practice. Right. But I think that the language in there, it's important. There's also laws about yeah, it. Yeah, there's also laws. And certainly with, with any conditional use permit, if it, get, if it gets approved with any conditional use permit, if there is a continual violation of any conditions or of the permit that's issued, that can be brought back to Resource Planning Committee for review of that. And if the Resource Planning Committee wishes, they can revoke that conditional use permit. Okay. Um, so there are that, that's important. I'm glad you brought that point up, Jeff. Thank you. I have a question too. Would this cover, um, for instance, some of the campgrounds in Southern Door have specific uh, fireworks displays um, prepared and paid for by the campgrounds on holidays? Would that say that would not be um, permitted at this campground? Correct. That would not be permitted at this campground. Based on the way that condition is written? Based on the, the no fireworks are allowed in the campground. Thank you. Uh, condition number nine, shelter units, so those are the, the cabin units that were within the uh, campground. Shelter units shall not be plumbed, wired, heated, or set up to allow for cooking appliances unless the Door County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance is amended to allow for such provisions. If at such time as those regulations change and those improvements are to be added to any or all of the shelter units, the Door County Land Use Services Department shall be notified prior to installation. And the purpose for this, the second part of <coughs> this condition is state camping regulations have changed, I, I don't know how many years ago, but they did change where campgrounds are now allowed to basically put a, um, a, a camping cabin, which is a 400 square foot cottage, is really what people can do per uh, state camping regulations. Uh, we have been looking at amending our camping ordinance to become more consistent with state regulations um, but at this time the way our ordinance reads and the way this condition reads is that you can't have any plumbing sanitary electricity uh, etc question unless i'm messed up here i think that they're going to have some cottages well that are going to be attached connected to the sewer no they will no. not be let me, uh, I'll pull up the camping plan real quick. I think they're stub to allow They're going to stub to allow it in the future if it's allowed in the future. You're right. I missed that. You're correct. Because I was wondering how they flush the toilet with that water. <laughs> That's all right, Jeff. They, well, no, we, we they're going to run the lines, but they can't connect them unless the zoning ordinance changes, <coughs> unless it's amended to allow it. And it. Currently, the ordinance reflects that condition. It's not allowed at this time. Okay. And the cabins are shown in the center of the campground there, uh, where those are, and then also uh, around the pond. Okay. So back to 10.
So condition number 10, a sign shall be stall, installed near the campground exit requesting that all patrons exiting in, the, in an RV or a vehicle hauling a camping unit turn right onto Bagno Road, Road for safety reasons. In addition, the campground informational brochure, website, and any other print or digital media informing information regarding the campground shall contain the same safety recommendation. Yep question on that condition. Uh, does anybody have any concerns? I brought it up earlier in regard to, I mean, the, the language in that condition um, says the, uh, a sign shall be installed near the camp campground exit requesting that all patrons existing in, in an RV or a vehicle hauling camping unit turn right onto Bagnell Road. Uh, I would like to see signage that says left hand yes. turns prohibited. Yeah, because more that's stronger. Directing them to turn right. I would say more, more directing all patrons or no left turn. I'm just saying. Well, oh, you who's going to enforce? Them? Well, I understand, but I mean, it, I mean, I have a parking lot that says no. You know, we 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 have a sign that says do not exit or whatever it says. It's, I mean, it helps people exit to the rear, and you know, so I think a sign that says no left uh, a sign a condition that says. Uh, no left turn would be much more, much more direct. So I would offer that as a condition that says no left uh, signage be installed that says no left turn exiting the campground. I wonder if that's something that the town can um, have as an ordinance for that road. Um, I don't know what the what the. Well, you mean from Bagnell Road on to. Uh, Highway 57. I'm, no. I'm saying from the campground on the Bagnell, but uh, since it's not since it's not on the town, if we if we put a condition on the campground site that says signage must be installed that says no left turn, or just say requiring that all patrons exiting turn right. I mean, you're saying the same thing, right? But if we if we had something, if the town would support something like this, and be has an ordinance that would say that on the sign by town ordinance. Uh, but we can't yeah, condition we, that. Yeah, we can yeah. that. But we can certainly can we can certainly have require a sign to be installed that says no left turn. So that I would offer that as a condition. Signage be installed um, near the exit. I can I can come up with something okay. here. Uh, a sign shall be installed near the campground exit stating no left turn onto Bagno Road for safety reasons in addition to the campground. Fair enough. And can we add to it that we encourage the town to look at it from the ordinance standpoint? I mean, I, I don't think we, we can require that tonight, but we can we require that they look at it? Much like we've done with the DOT, that we be, they be approached? Maybe if we just require the, the, um, yeah, the owner to petition the town for that. Correct. I don't think we can require that, can we? Petition. We can require the petition, I think. Can we get it on the agenda? And we can certainly, certainly require a petition uh, like that, similar to how we, uh, in the past, we required people to talk to the DOT about traffic concerns. Um, but it's up to you as the board if you'd like that condition. Certainly understanding that it's just a petition or a request mm -hmm. and nothing would be. Right. For sure. Right. So, uh, is that something that yes. you think? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to include that in the condition. So it would be. In addition, the, the owners would petition the town for a uh, an ordinance um, prohibiting a left turn from the campground onto uh, Bengal Road. And the and the t the town could just say no, to, right? But that's just at least we're asking. Mm -hmm. Give it more teeth. So the owner shall petition to the town to create an ordinance to enforce a no left turn on uh, from the campground onto Big No Road. So what I have here is the owner shall petition the town to create an ordinance to enforce 
no left turns onto Bagnell Road from the campground. Okay. Condition number 11, a Door County Sanitary Permit shall be issued and the system installed prior to use of the campground. Condition number 12, the stormwater management design plan submitted by Bodwin Surveying and Engineering dated October 13th, 2017 shall be installed and maintained in accordance with the November 9th, 2017 memorandum from Greg Colthurst, Door County Soil and Water Conservation Department. Condition number 13, all but the easterly lot lines of the property shall be all but the easterly lot lines of the property shall be screened via evergreen vegetation as depicted on the approved site plan prior to the use of the campground. Fast growing cedars shall be planted along the easterly lot lines no further than eight feet apart as shown on the site plan or per the tree supplier's recommendation, whichever spacing is less. Um, so just to go into that, you know, what's required with the campground is that there's at least uh, one two foot tall evergreen tree every 10 feet along the property lines. That's what's required per the ordinance. Um, so what they're saying in that condition is that standard is adequate for the north, south, and west property lines. Uh, for the east property lines, it's requiring that they use a fast growing cedar tree uh, and then also that they're planted eight feet apart as opposed to 10 feet apart. Monica, do you wanna, you've had some comments about this earlier. Is this appropriate for time to discuss this? Uh, I probably. Um, I would actually like to condition that they be a larger tree, a taller tree, or and or the berm idea is great. I haven't thought about that part, that a berm be created on the trees planted. So you've got double the height if it's only a two foot tree and your berm is two feet, then you've at least got four feet to start with. Well, I guess one th just one thing, uh, just interject with the berm. Um, certainly not, not a bad idea, uh, but that may affect the stormwater the, management the dream, plan. The drainage. Right. Okay. With, with, the, with the approved plan, it may, it may need to be modified if that is a condition that's put on this. Gotcha. And just so you know, that section of the ordinance that requires the two foot high evergreens, those have to be able to obtain a height of what is it? I believe 15 it's feet. 15 feet, and they have to be maintained. So if one of them dies, they'd have to be replaced. So, I mean, Obviously, they're not going to stay two feet high forever. No, uh, yeah, but I, I concur with some of the testimony. I've planted a lot of trees in Northern Door, and it's going to take a long time to get to that 15 feet height if there are two feet. Well, no, the, the type of tree, but I can't right off the top of my head think of those that, you know, we've even planted around our property um, just by, you know, chance. People have given us trees left over from whatever, and conditions make a difference on uh, how fast they grow and all that kind of thing but exactly. and that's um, part of this is um, talking to the recommendation of the installer I think or the, where they the tree correct it would um, well the the condition is requiring the fast growing tr cedar trees along the easterly lot lines no further than eight feet apart um, or per the or per the tree installer's recommendations, and th and that's that's specifically regard in regards to the spacing. Um, certainly, they would still need to be at very minimum ten feet apart. Um, the condition here is requesting an eight foot spacing, um, but for some reason there is a recommendation by the tree supplier that they are planted let's say nine feet apart then we would certainly accept that. And so this would have to be a certified nursery grower, or how do we decide whether they are there, yeah, arborist or something that, you know, is not just an opinion? Yeah, why, why, I'm not sure why that would be in there. Why not just leave it at eight feet? And, and, uh, well, I'm, gu I'm guessing the, the purpose of why not just eight feet outright is that there are tree species that are recommended that eight feet would be way too close and they'd be choking Some each other species out. grow faster and better when they're um, spaced exactly, differently. Exactly, right. I guess just to go with your concern, Monica, possibly shall be spaced no further than eight feet apart as shown in the site plan 
or her a certified arborist's recommendation. recommendation. Certainly, that's probably going to be anyway through her, whoever they get the trees from. Um, but uh, that's one recommendation that I might come up with. But certainly, it's up to you. And Monica, since we're talking about this, and, and it's a concern of mine as well, um, I, you know, because I just think visually, you know, I think it's important, and I think from a sound issue, like you brought up earlier, uh, was um, do you think that perhaps it would be better if there was a double row of trees? I mean, that's nothing we've talked about as well, and, and we never really discussed, but it, you know, I mean, uh, again, I mean, I like what you're getting at when we're talking, both you and Bob here talking about an arborist, and I mean, I recently had to screen a, a warehouse building, and I was required to put in 10-foot evergreen arborvitas, and um, I think I put in almost a dozen of them, and trees are expensive. I, I mean, it, it, to, to screen this entire property, it's going to be an undertaking. It's going to so, um, but I do like the idea. I think you offered it earlier that perhaps the trees be a little larger than two feet. I would encourage that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I mean, I would, you know, even if you're offering four or six foot trees, that would be better to me than starting out at two foot trees. Correct. And this is just on the east side of the property. Though. Well, I, I, yeah. yeah I, I, well, based on the condition that the RP side, I think that's fine. I don't. Although I do, I do have some concerns about you know where they want to build their house, and because the property owner on that side was, con and they were like, hey, what about us? But there was he, testimony about that the other night, and one of the young ladies said that they were going to tree the north side and fence it. Well, I think that what I heard the testimony. keep the horses from going into the cor Correct. So I don't think with the, when we get into the fencing end of it, we didn't want a deer fence on that property on that side. But I think it's important to have trees the entire perimeter of the property, just right. not just not perhaps the way it's worded in the RPC. I, I, in my opinion, I think it's important. Uh, I'm okay with a majority of the trees being two foot, but I think interspersing some um, that start out a little bit larger, just so you know, there's just that little bit more going on, and people have an idea of what it will look like as well later on. A two foot tree to a deer is dessert. Seriously. <laughs> well, that's why they have to replace them if they're gone. Right. But it wouldn't matter if it was a four foot tree, they'd still, because they're nice and, and have tender shoots and all the rest of it. So we, it's, it's hard to um, condition for the deer other than the fence, you know, because they'll eat anything. So you're, you're, you're not uh, pursuing the berm idea because of the storm? With the right, I think that would interfere with the drainage plan. That, that's yeah. correct, I hadn't thought about that. Well, another thought too, instead of a berm, is you do a triangular fence, trees, planting, four or six foot, preferably six foot, and have have them eight feet apart, and then one right here in the middle. So, so, so <coughs> is, is, is it possible that um, some of the things that I've seen in the past is that um, a landscape plan be submitted to the plan to the to back to this board for approval? Is that something we can do? Right now, it's all verbal. No, I think it, would, it would, I think it would be need to be put on as a condition um, because the yeah, but why? there is what if we come back, I mean, it, and then it, it just keeps coming back and forth. Um, well, I, I understand that, but I was, couldn't I offer a condition that says a certified landscaping plan be submitted and approved by this board by such and such a date, and then it goes back, and then we, if, we're not, if we don't approve it, and it goes back to them again. I mean, I've dealt with developments that I've had to submit certified landscaping plans. A certified landscaping plan showing what? Though? Now remember, the ordinance standard for campgrounds require the trees all the way around the entire perimeter. We, re we remember that, right? And they have to be at least two feet high, be able to maintain at least 15 feet. They show them staggered around there already. And this, well, con uh, okay, this I, condition I, was an addition to, that. to yeah. that standard. Right. Okay, I mean, I'm comfortable with that way that is, but I, you know, uh, you know, I've seen so many plans that just don't turn out the way it is. 
That's why I want some teeth in this to make sure that that is indeed the way it's going to be. Well, that's a standard and it's required. Okay. Um, and you would, the planning department would be comfortable enforcing that then? Correct. We have to. Correct. So then the, the thing that I for, I'd forgotten, and I apologize, the beads were staggered and I saw that plan before. So are, we're still need to decide if we want to um, condition that some of those trees be taller. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I feel that they should be. I, mean, I feel strongly about that. I think it's going to take some time for those trees to reach mature, maturity, and and I, I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, I I mean the ordinance standards say two feet, but I think they should be planted double in size right out of the gate. If you have four foot trees, and then not pick and choose here, but I think four feet four foot trees would be sufficient. But again, just on the east side of the property. Um, all the way around. All the way around. So we would we'd still, still leave on the east side the eight foot um, distance, or according to the recommendation of the arborist, the rest of them could still be 10 feet as per ordinance. Is that what it is, 10 feet? Yeah. It's 10 feet per ordinance, correct? 10 feet. Yeah. yeah I, that's I, what you're agreeing to? That's what I would people. agree to. Okay. We're trying to. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So what, what was. That, that we have four foot trees along the, just along the eastern property line. Um, no, the entire perimeter. The entire perimeter. The entire perimeter. The entire perimeter. Yeah, but uh, other than the easterly part, they could be still ten feet apart. But um, the easterly part, um, the eight foot, or per recommendation, per recommendation of the arborist. So all required. If the trees were all the same, I I would guess we should go for the recommendation of the arborist. Well, again, I mean, I, I guess it's not our purview to worry about cost, but I mean, this uh, it is. I know. Yeah. And <coughs> I mean, to me, at least on the west side, where you have, first of all, an empty field, and then you have the farm, um, there's quite a bit of distance. I mean, I can we mitigate our request a little bit on the west side to, to maybe alleviate some of the cost? I mean, that doesn't seem to be a critical area to have the trees. Leave those at two feet, you're saying? Yeah. Understood. Okay. I think it's understood. Simple. That's why we're having yep. this back and forth. I understand. Are you finding anything, Rick? So based on what I'm hearing right now with Fred's recommendation, it would be all trees. Uh, all trees used for screening along the exterior borders would need to be at least four feet tall at, at the time of establishment, except for the trees along the western property line. The trees along the eastern property lines would need to be spaced at least eight feet apart using fast growing uh, cedar trees. Um, along the easterly property line, we use fast growing cedar trees at least eight feet apart or per the certified arborist recommendation. Yes. <coughs> okay, is it my understanding that the four feet is above the ball? But then, Jeff, I think the other part is that the north would be also four feet, but 10 feet spacing. Okay, yep. Per ordinance. Right. And four feet above the ground, not above the ball. Is Correct, that's how we would measure so four, saying four feet above grade. What's that? Correct. What's that <coughs> You're talking along the north? No, the ball of the Northeast tree. and south. Yeah, we know. Yeah. The northeast and south. And on the west, Fred? Wait. Okay. okay, north. Well, east is that east other. This is its own thing. Yeah. Oh, so the north and south, basically. <coughs> So the west, let's just go by property lines and directions. West property line would need to have at least two foot tall trees spaced 10 feet apart. Correct. Yeah, that's, a, that's an ordinance standard. That's, 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 an that's ordinance the standard. ordinance standard. Correct. On the west side. Yeah. Along the north and south property lines, the trees would need to be at least four feet tall at the time of planting, spaced 10 feet apart. Yes. yes. And I'm going to say all trees required per section 4.07 
parent to parent H. That's what I was looking up of the Door County zoning ordinance shall be four feet high along the north and south lot line. Correct. That's a section that says you have to screen the entire perimeter. So on um, the north and south, they're going to be four feet high. And four feet, uh, but 10 feet apart as opposed to eight? Correct. Yeah. The north, well, north, and, south, really north the and south is eight foot spacing, minimum four feet apart. Okay. Um, oh, wait. No. Sit up backwards. The normal requirement is 10 feet, and I think that's what you, so we, that's just a standard. Yes. By ordinance standard. By yes. ordinance standard. Yes. The only eight foot section is along the easterly side. Yeah. Oh. So we're talking three different things. Yes. We're talking retaining the condition along the eastern property line, using the original or the ordinance standard along the western property line and on the north and south property line requiring the trees to be four feet high and using the standard 10 foot space. Yes. And, and along the eastern property line, they also need to be four feet high too. Is that what? Yeah. Wrong yes. Right away? Yes. So the north. So wait, you are changing that condition correct. because that's a. Correct. So the north. I've heard different things. Yeah. North, east, and south property lines, they would have four foot tall trees the west property line would be two foot tall trees. Um, as far as spacing, the north, south, and west would be a minimum of 10 foot spacing between the trees. Yes. The eastern property lines would be a minimum of, or a, a minimum of eight, or a maximum, of, I should say a maximum of eight feet. Maximum of eight. Unless they are, uh, unless the certified arborist recommends differently, um, and the trees along the eastern lake property line need to be fast growing cedar trees. Yes. I, I, I would like to interject that uh, we do the eight foot separation on the south border as well um, because of some concerns in the, in the testimony about uh, view from the highway. I, how do my fellow board members feel about that? I agree with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have an issue with it. I don't feel strongly one way or the other, but I don't object to it. That highway corridor that you're coming. So eight foot on south and east. Wait, so condition <laughs> condition number thirteen stays the same, right? No, they need to have at least four foot tall trees in condition number thirteen. So here. Okay. So there was any hiking there. So I'll go over this again here. The north property line would need to have four foot tall trees spaced eight feet apart unless recommended by the certified arborist that it needs to be more but no greater than 10 feet apart. No, that's eastern, eastern, not the north. <laughs> north can still be 10 feet. So the north property line, four foot tall trees, uh, spaced 10 feet apart. The south property line would be four foot tall trees, spaced eight feet apart, unless recommended by certified arborists to be further away, but no greater than 10 feet apart. The west property line would be the ordinance standard with two foot tall trees, space 10 feet apart. And then along the east property line will be four foot tall trees spaced eight feet apart. Again, um, with the certified arborist caveat, and the, those will need to be fast growing cedars. Amen. All trees will be. <laughs> all trees will be fast growing cedar? Yes. Only, just, only, the, only the ones along the east property the, line. Only the ones along that east property line, right? Yes. Yes. Correct. Excuse me, but the current 13 and <laughs> whichever is left, you're taking that out now. The recommendation of the arbor. Yeah. Uh, we, so although we talked about um, keeping all the conditions in, we're modifying the number 13. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. This is all going to be under one condition? Yes. <laughs> one big condition. Yes. The big one. The biggest one. There'll be a test tomorrow morning. Okay. <coughs> so 
So back to the list. Uh, condition number 15. No trespassing, no trespassing uh, signs. 14. Deer fence. Oh, condition number 14. A six foot high deer fence of the style proffered by the applicant shall be installed on the property along, property along the entire easterly lot lines east of the required tree plantings. Any internal hardware associated with the fence shall face the campground property and there shall be no ingress slash egress points through the entire length of the fence. Any comments? I think it's a good condition. I would have never thought of it, it's to be honest with you. It's a good condition. The question then is, is that really going to keep them out? Well, I, I, it's not to keep the deer out, it's to keep the uh, campers out. <laughs> well, it's kind of like when I said there's a gated community, it's not like to keep everybody out, it's to keep the people in. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, number 15. Number, number 15, no trespassing sign shall be installed along the easterly lot lines every 50 feet. And then number 16 is the project shall be completed within four years of the date of the issuance of the conditional use permit. You know, I'm curious from a planning department standpoint, how did that language get inserted? Which? With the four years. I mean, we're so used to um, completed within one year, and I realize that, I mean, that's what our parameters always have been. So I'm just curious, I mean, was that a suggestion that the planning department staff came up with? I'm not sure exactly where that came from. Um, there may have been some length. negotiating at the hearing too. Um, but with larger projects, they will provide for a longer time to finish the project. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I, I have some issues with that one. I, I do. I mean, I built marinas and I'm under a deadline to have them done by, if I'm working all winter or if I'm my project, I'm under a deadline. I think four years is pretty liberal. Is it, is this mean, um, they can be completing these conditions while the campground is being used? Well, I wonder if that was a part of it is that, you know, just uh, again trying to spread the cost out that, that rather than being the upfront cost for 130, that you get it operating and hopefully use some of the revenue stream to continue the project and have it fully completed by four years. I mean, I wasn't there, but that, that seems well, could, could be a possibility. I'm wondering, yeah. I'm wondering, yeah. With certain well, suits. Certain specific conditions within that list. There's some of these conditions that are required to be done prior to use of the campground, such right. as the screening, such as the sanitary system. Um, so those would need to be done before the campground's ever used. Um, the rest of the conditions are just ongoing conditions that need to be adhered to. Um, so they would they would have to have these specific conditions that state that it needs to be completed prior to use of the campground. Those would need to be done. Um, but as far as continuing the expansion of that campground through that four-year period could still occur in that time. So for instance, the interior um, planting of shrubbery or tree, the landscaping stuff could be ongoing within this four years? I'm just trying to Correct. picture what, what fits into that um, particular... Correct. The uh, interior landscaping would, would be allowed to occur. Do you issue... Do you, do you uh, do you issue a certificate of compliance? Yes, uh, our department with all permits that we issue, um, once that project has been completed, uh, we will go out and take a look at the property and issue certificates of compliance once that project is entirely completed. Is it necessary then for this board to install language that says the certificate of compliance shall be issued? No, it, it would not be necessary. Um, it's either whichever one would come first. If they finish the entire project as, it, as it's laid out in the proposal, uh, we would go out at that time, whether it's one year or four years from now, and, and we would take a look at it um, and issue a certificate of compliance if everything is met. Well, there, I mean, there was some testimony that there's concerns that the project might not get finished. And I don't know what responsibility we have as a board to address those concerns. Well, I think if you extend, first of all, there's going to be little construction. Everything's, there's not that many buildings that they're going to construct. So everything's going to be underground and, and laid out for pants. 
I think four years is a long time. I do too. I, I, I'd like to see it be two. Two. I, I mean, I've been involved in enough commercial so projects. Why don't, why don't we do this, Mars? Uh, move this along a little bit, and I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> uh, but we can put that. We need to find out why, before we set this in concrete, why that condition was stated to four years. And we don't want to open it up tonight. No, but I think the planning department, I don't think, I mean, this board historically, I mean, when we deal with uh, variances, we give applicants a year. Right. Uh, I mean, that's what we, we, you know, we give applicants a year to complete the project. And I can, I can give a little bit of a comment with, um, even with variances, when we go through that, uh, with that year. They can give, they can they renew have, it. They, I have, well, that actually with, even with the, variances that we do in a different process they have a year to obtain the permit, permit. and then they have a year after that to complete so that's two years. and that's, that's typically, two years. Typically, and typically a two-year process for and then they permit. can renew it several times so it could go on to be a two or three or four year process. so this what this limit this limitation does here is it limits the amount of times that they can renew that permit so if they would wait one full year to obtain the permit for the campground or for those buildings now in the we campground. Have three. And then they'd have a whole another year to at least start it. That's two years. Um, then they could renew that permit um, beyond that. Well, so the timing of taking out the permit is sometimes plays into how you want to do that. With typical projects. Yeah. Correct. Um, with this, they're, they're really only going to take out, uh, if, if the conditional use permit gets approved, they'd only be taking out permits for the actual structures being constructed on that property. Well, and so John knows, and I know, you want to have your T's crossed and your I's dotted prior to coming into you to apply for the permit. That's correct. Can you give us an example of any other projects that have, have we've given a four-year uh, 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 Just one, before you finish, sorry, Bob. Are we limiting this more than we would have with this um, condition wasn't on there? Because you're saying they could renew. Um, there, there was a period when there, the RPC didn't condition. There was no limitation. And some of these projects went on forever. And that was the concern to put a limit on it and say it's done at a certain date. Now, I don't know if they would negotiated this at the RPC and there's reasons for this. I don't remember receiving any testimony during the public hearing. No, we didn't. I'm, so we didn't. I'd be inclined to leave the condition as is only because we didn't gather any testimony unless anybody here remembers and I don't know the reason for four years exactly. But in, in, in regard to their concern is that we're actually short, shortening the amount of time that they actually could have if we didn't have this condition. Right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I thought that was your concern that was going to go on and on and on. With this condition cannot go on and yeah, on when it, the deal is done. You're right. I mean, that was my concern. But I think Bob asked a question that was pretty germane. It had to deal with other conditional use projects. Are we treating this differently than I we... I was trying to answer it, but I, I can't answer it exactly. I know they've they, they put deadlines on different projects. I don't know what the average deadline is. One is vegetable. I think that might have, that might have had a deadline on it. I thought we just set a year on that uh, standard. And so with, even with that building, they could have, they could keep renewing that as long as progress is made. Gotcha. Yeah, what we do is tell them when they have to start. I guess the answer to that is off the top of our heads, we cannot, can't, we cannot think of one. If I do think of one, I will, I will let you know. Um, but I cannot think of one off the top of my head. Would you be more comfortable with three year? Well, I, I mean, I understand now a little bit more. Monica, you know, got some clarification, so uh, and Jeff answered it. Yeah, and I would tell properly you with Rick that without having any questioning during the preliminary rounds, we don't know the reason. So to change it, whether we change it one year or two years, that might be a, have been a good reason, and we don't still know. I, I don't have a problem just leaving it four years. I don't think it's an important condition. Yeah. The winery, by the way, was uh, it, they gave them, or, you gave, or they were given until October 
2019. So it was a year and a half or that would be two years, right? So, so there there was a limitation where if they took out the permit Almost two years. and renewed it, um, they, they still had a, a drop end date that you have they have to be completed with that project. By two years. Into within two years. Okay. Correct. But I know it does vary, but what the average is I can't answer. I think, you know, I mean, I've been involved in development projects. I think you can complete this in two years. And I think, you know, I, I believe it. Well, getting back to what Fred said earlier, um, you know, if they're looking at starting the campground to be able to afford to do some of the other things that are uh, being mentioned here, I don't think that's a good business plan. I think they need to have enough money to, to put this. No, I, I, I mean, I go back. I don't know the reason. I mean, I, I mean, <coughs> well, it is unusual, but we didn't we didn't really question that. So I mean, I, it, there could be a very good reason that we're not aware of it by changing it. We screw things up. I don't know. I, well, I, but see, we're not really we're using this as a yeah. guide. We're not okay. using it. Well, as, let's. I guess let's decide yeah. to move on. We got Yeah, I, I, I'll, I could be voted down on this, so I'm listening to it. I'm comfortable with whatever the rest of you want to decide on this. Somebody wants to modify that four years, so I'm be it. If not, we'll leave it alone. I'm fine leaving it Based on what Rick and Jeff uh, told us. I could be talked into three. I, I can go along. Four? Four. Okay. We'll leave it as four. Monica? Yeah, I would. Fine. I, would. Okay. I won't argue with you. Okay, I'll leave it. We'll leave it at four. We'll leave it at that condition as stated, number sixteen. Okay, um, those were all the conditions that the RPC established, and we modified uh, a couple of them. And then, um, well, if I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure where this fits into the discussion. It's kind of off the program, but one of the things that, that in the letters that we got and several people in testimony said that they didn't feel that the public's interest was being considered. That was something they, and somebody even said, well, they didn't think the RPC addressed that issue. Now, interestingly, that's not one of the criteria, but to the extent that so many people expressed that as a concern, you know, I actually spent a fair amount of time trying to ponder that and, and, and. Well, we weren't there, so it's hard for us to know, you no, know, we weren't at the RPC. No, but I'm just here. saying, I, as hearing this new, I mean, I, to me, it, it's something that at least I want to address, at least my thought process. And I, you know, what I did, again, there was nothing in the RPC material that defined public interest. And I know we don't use our worksheet, but I like the way that our other hearings, that they define public interest. And if I may, it says, the short-term and long-term impacts of the proposal and the cumulative impacts of similar projects on the interests of the neighbors, the community, and even the state should be considered. Review should focus on the general public's interest rather than just the narrow interests or impacts on neighbors, patrons, or residents in the vicinity of the project. And it goes on to say that <coughs> determining the public's interest is not a popularity contest. So, you know, I, I think that's something where, you know, we've heard from the immediate neighbors, but as I try to frame my mind around what went on and the due process that was, was followed, I mean, to me, in terms of the broader public interest, um, you know, the Land Use Commission developed a plan in 2014. It included the core area that's as part of this property. And then the, the both the Planning Commission and the, and the Town Board supported that and approved this. And, and I mean, um, from the testimony we had, there wasn't a lot of objection or strong objection points. So again, the due process was followed. And then they had the support of the Jackson Port Business Owners Association. Um, so I mean, I, 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 I mean, candidly, if somebody came to my door and said, I'd like to put a campground across the street from your house, would you like me to? I'd probably say, no, I don't like to or don't want you to. But I think in this case, the due process was followed and I, I think that the the broader interests of the community are served by what they're doing, not necessarily just as it says here, it's not defined by the, the neighboring properties. So. Well, and, and I concur completely, and I and I applaud the county that has created the process. So, I mean, they've created the process, so we're now here at this point um, working on conditions. And so we have those, um, those conditions established thus far, and I'd like to move this forward, and I'd like to go back to our worksheets and go through the possible conditions and if there's something else that we need to add to other than what we've done thus far. So first and foremost, if I use the worksheet as an example, uh, is there anything in addition 
uh, for a possible condition that deals with noise that anybody would like to add. I think currently we have some conditions. We do have conditions established that deal with noise, so I, my opinion is sufficient. Thank you. Agree. Okay. Uh, one, one question I had about yes. that. One of the things that came up in testimony was uh, personal generators. Uh -huh. And I thought that the um, owner said something about no generators will be allowed in the electrical hookups in the campground. Is that accurate or? I don't recall either. I don't recall either. I can Do you want to offer a condition in regard to personal generators? I, I would. If, if I, I believe electrical hookups are available for this campground. If I remember correctly from testimony. Yes, I and believe I, that. And I think fast forwarding that John's going to talk about having a, a backup generator for the sure. entire campground. So if we put that in, I think, you know, then saying no personal generators would make sense. Now they've got options to electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd like to add that as a condition. So basic, just say again all you want. Uh, no personal generators will be allowed to be in operation. Because the campgrounds will probably have 30 amp circuits to take care of the big boys. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then the next um, possible condition would deal with dust. I think that we talked, and, and John, you had some things that you might want to address regarding dust. Yeah, whatever that product is, and I <laughs> apologize for not having that name, but, but it's used widely in Door County. Uh, even milky looking and then all of a sudden it's clear. Calcium carbonate? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know it's you're all right. Well, I can't take, I can't take any, yeah. sorry, I can't, yeah, I can't take any testimony for fear of. Well, is, is information testimony? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. It's all relative. <laughs> but other than water, what I put down here is other than water and oil. So just for my notes, mm -hmm. environmentally friendly. Yes. Um, you know, so we don't have to give a brand name or something, but an environmentally friendly I'll find that one uh, dust control liquid. Somebody Google see what it is. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think, I think that's going to come down to best management practices. I believe that the campgrounds are going to want to, no different than, no different than perhaps the way Psy deals with it, how we deal with it at Marshall Point, because I wish we had paved roads, but we don't. And I don't know the material they put on the roads, but, you know, it, it's material that, it, you know, that management will do best, man will handle best management practice when it deals with dust. Because they don't want to be, they don't want to be there either. No. So I, I'm comfortable with the way it's worded. I am too. Okay. Um, the next uh, okay. pos. Um, so we're not. Adding we're not doing anything different. Okay. Okay. That's we're just what I thought okay. Was. The next one deals with access. Um, access is. I I assume that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, no for rushing. safe vehicular and pedestrian access. I'll be quiet and listen to the rest of you first and foremost. I don't know what we can do and what we should do um, because I, you know, I, you heard me earlier. I mean, I said I believe it's up to the applicant to come forward with that information. I don't know that we can condition those things on the state highway. John, you've had some practice with this. Well, I hate to be negative, but the state's going to say what I said earlier. We're here to move traffic. Not slow it down. Well, what did you do for Little Sweet? We put, we put in yourself. acceleration and de acceleration lanes on both sides of the road. Can, can I, we also offered a condition on the winery. We had a condition in regard to, we were concerned about ingress and egress. Did we, uh, you have that with you, right? I, I brought it along. Um, do you want me to read it? I, I do. Yes. Uh, the applicant shall request the Wisconsin Department of Transportation to review the proposed development and determ determine whether any improvements be made to increase safety of the Bagnell Road and State Highway 57 intersection. The applicant shall provide documentation of the Department of Transportation determination to the Door County Land Use Services Department. 
the applicants are responsible for implementation slash installation of any improvements recommended by the Wisconsin DFT and the improvements <coughs> shall be implemented slash installed before the before the campground is open to the public or the winery, winery. in that case I'm in sorry. that case yeah I was yeah, trying to adding a yeah, no sorry so yeah. that and and I think you know we spent a great deal of time on that because we were concerned about ingress egress there as well we can't mandate that these things be put in but at least we have some language inserted that if this goes forward yeah. um, there so has to be you know I, I wish that that would have been addressed at the at the Jacksonport town level the plan commission level first and foremost because they would have had plenty of time to discuss it before applying for a conditional use or we might have had information but but here we are so I think we need that that's language that I think needs to be inserted if we're going to go forward with this well uh, and I agree and I don't see any reason to change we spent a lot of time the last one trying to get it down to what was doable and reasonable so I, I guess I'd like a little more information on what happened with Little Sweet. Um, you decided to put these lanes in yourself, then it wasn't part of your. If we wanted building permits. If you wanted the building permits, you had to put the. Yes. Um, and that was what decided by the county or the town board? Do you remember? No, it was decided by the. Well, that was a condition that they put in there. Okay. Okay. So we can put a condition in that an acceleration lane. They can either builds. make the make the deal or break the deal. Well, we weren't going to let them break the deal. I mean, we had too many millions of dollars involved. So the DOT it. would not do it? No. But you... So we don't have the money. Okay. So there was a so conditional we, use that, the permit that said you had to have that lane there. If the DOT didn't do it, you had to pay for it. That is correct. Okay. And that was by the county? The county made that condition? Yes. Okay. No. The county didn't have anything to do with it. It was... We were after the state to do it because it's a state highway, not a county highway. Right. Big difference. Right. But you said there was a condition that you wouldn't get your permits if you didn't do right. that. Right. And who put that condition on? I think his name is Charlie Turner. So it was the <laughs> county. It was the county. Right. Yeah. That was my question. Thank you. And I'm, for me, I'm fine with what we did with the winery. I think that wording lets people cite. I mean, I. I it's entirely possible that they're not necessary. I mean, I, I don't, I don't. Uh. Well, uh, Fred, I think we've got a different situation here though in the winery. We're gonna have a lot more people um, that are gonna be uh, entering and exiting off, well, not, not exiting with their own yeah, turn, and, I guess. And that's where, I, you know, and, and I don't necessarily see that. I think because of the winery, you're gonna have vehicular traffic coming and going on an ongoing basis where I think people, and again, I'm not a camper, but uh, to me, you've got 130 people that, let's say, they come up for a week or a weekend, they're going to stagger their arrival and departure. So I, I, I just don't see this as a backup of multiple RVs trying to get into the campground. I, I, I could be wrong, but that's uh, just the way I, I don't see it that way. I just The winery was on a straight section of the road, um, and this is a curved, uh, well, the, uh, a speed change here. So. Well, I, I, and for me, I mean, there's a curve down at the bottom, but I thought there was plenty of straight section. And I mean, my, my next thing to me addressing this is doing something with getting the speed reduced to 30 through that section, not have people accelerating through that section. I think that's, I'm more interested in trying to slow people down. And to me, that's, a, that's a, a, as good a solution that we have some control over and then let the DOT get involved and use the wording here to, to make sure they do take a look at it and give you know their expert advice. But we can't put it, put this into the conditional use. We can't put that as a condition. Why not? Um, because the town has to apply to the DOT for, for a speed zone change. The owners of the property have no, okay. um, no avenue there. That's a, that's a state highway, that's not a town highway. No, but, no, I mean, but Bob's right, I think. You, I think the request has to come from the town oh, to the DOT. Oh, oh, okay. yeah, I don't think we can, we can or, as much as I would like to agree with you and that we extend that 30 mile an hour speed limit that much further south, um, but that my experience has always been that the town has to request that of the DOT. That makes sense. Okay, I was, I'm sorry, I was going back to the, the uh, condition that Rick was reading, and why is that not sufficient? Because it's, um, 
from what John was telling us, that the uh, DOT, there's a good chance that they wouldn't uh, recommend something like this or, or, or approve it or approve paying for it, I guess is probably what John was saying more than anything else. So it's an out. Okay, and would you read that part about who has to take care of it if it's recommended? Well, the applicants shall request the Wisconsin DFT to review the proposed development and determine whether any improvement should be um, should be made to increase the safety of the intersection. The applicant shall provide documentation of the Wisconsin DFT determination to the Door County Land Use Services Department. The applicants are responsible for implementation slash installation of any improvements recommended by the DFT and the improvements shall be implemented slash installed before the the business is open to the public. So if I heard that correctly, that means the developer, if they say no, the developer will take doesn't have to do it. No. No. With that condition, if there is a recommendation by the DOT to put in acceleration or deceleration lanes and the DOT says this is a recommendation but we will not pay for it, the developer would be required to pay yeah, for it correct. and install okay. those. And that's what we were required to do. That language was in there. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason we chose that because you can't put a condition that says they have to put in turning lanes because the DOT may say no, you can't put in turning lanes. That and I think that's and that's was the thought process when this condition was done last time. Yeah, I mean, we have had a bit of, had a bit of discussion about overstepping our authority to make and things. I happen. think that's what. It, yeah. yeah. And, and we still have the ability as we go forward here because the motion on the table is to deny the appeal and grant the conditional use permit. So when I call for the vote, that vote may fail, correct, or it may pass. Correct. So then these conditions, and we we're right back at it again. Or, so we're not there yet, but we don't have to agree to this, but at least that language at this point uh, to make, remain consistent, I think is important to have in, in the language for this uh, conditional use permit application as well. Okay. But everybody would agree with that? Yes. The language that we used, yes. th then it's consistent. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, uh, since we're still talking about access, um, one, of the, one of the other issues that becomes troublesome and we heard a great deal of discussion in, from the, both the town and the, uh, the town where the walking paths only go as far as far south as the uh, Jacksonport Bakery up till that area and there was plenty of discussion about extending those walking paths up to this area. Um, again, that pie in the sky phrase was used. Um, and um, there is no question that pedestrian access will be uh, a difficult thing to achieve to this site. And again, I reiterated earlier that I wish this would have been discussed and taken into consideration at the town level before it got to this board. So I don't know that we have the ability or the power to create anything at this point, even with conditions to alleviate that issue. Um, but I'm. So I, I would like to think we do, but I don't, there's nothing, no language that I can come up with in knowing the engineering that's involved to put those type of uh, facilities or uh, infrastructure in. And I think um, Bob said earlier that the, the infrastructure just isn't in place uh, from a pedestrian standpoint. That ditch is steep. There's a lot of testimony that in, indicated I paid special attention to that as I was coming here tonight. And that is a deep ditch as you leave uh, leave Jacksonport on to the, coming onto the site. So there's going to be a great deal of engineering that's going to have to come into play to extend that walking path or and or sidewalks. Well, again, I, I mean, I I concur. Um, I don't know that we can put requirements in. Is there a way that we can encourage the Lordsons to work with the town to? Study feasibility on walkways. Study and 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 get cooperation to try to get the speed limit reduced and to get Bagnall squared off. Those are three things we talked about to make it more safe. I don't know that we can mandate that, but we is there some way we can at least mandate there be some discussion and and 
Yeah. Well, I, I think the burden is always on the applicant, Fred. I think you know yeah. all of us feel that way, and I think we can only can. I don't think we have the ability to uh, attach enough conditions onto every project that comes before us to solve all the problems. So we have to proceed and go through this. And I, I just don't. Uh, I mean. The town hasn't been willing to address that up until this point. They they want to do it, but they're but financially, it's going to be a tough thing for the town of Jacksonport to pull off. I mean, eventually, I'm sure they'll get there. But who pays for that infrastructure? Uh, that's something that the town has to figure out. I don't know that that's something this board needs to figure out. I think we no. either vote yes or uh, vote uh, yes or no on the merits, and and so be it. I, I, I just there's I would love to put conditions on, but knowing what's there, I don't think that we can do that. And, and I understand that's and that's, that's what I'm saying. I, I guess maybe the very fact that we're discussing it will encourage the people present well, to un undertake some. I'm I'm con I'm, con I'm convinced the town recognizes they've got an issue. Okay. But uh, but I you know. <laughs> I don't know that I could be comfortable to say that I could vote support it, support it, knowing it, knowing that just that they realize they have a problem. Well, there's not only a problem with this project, but I heard that is there a museum going in across the street? Well, there is. It's there now. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, historical, it's, it's society. historical society. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. So it's that you know both sides of the street. There's no question about it. Right. But that becomes a town issue as well, right. and those things should have been addressed prior to coming here. Right. Would have been made. It would have made my job easier had the had the infrastructure been in place. And I guess you know, I made the comment before. I I think we ought to do everything we can to make Door County highways and intersections as safe as possible. But when you go at, at some point, we can't engineer every single one. They're, they're all over the, the county. I mean, this is they're the, the county wasn't developed with this kind of traffic in mind. So, I mean, this isn't the only semi-dangerous or potentially dangerous intersection, walkway. Um, you know, no, I but, but I would, you know, I, and, I, and I appreciate you saying that, but I would say that if the town is going to have the wisdom to rezone the property, yep. and they also have to have the wisdom to provide uh, safe uh, pedestrian and vehicular traffic to true. the property as well. Yep. And, and so that's my big hang up with this project. Now, the way things stand right now, there's really no other way for them to accomplish anything in the way of a pedestrian way. Uh, well, other than, than you know, going out the back way, and again, I, 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 I don't, I know I as a parent would not let my kids go down that way. If there was a safer way to go, I wouldn't jeopardize their safety. Mm -hmm. So some of this you got to at least rely on human intuition and wisdom and, and parental guidance. I, yeah, well, we're going to have people that, again, are not familiar with the, the amount of traffic on this highway, and there is a, an attraction in yeah. town, you know, for them to want to go to town and the sure. beach, whatever else. And, 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 and I, I, for a board member, don't <clears throat> think it's, I mean, as we pro progress on this, we're going to have a lot of conditions on this, and, and the motion on the table is to deny the appeal, but if we turn it around and, and, and grant the appeal, then it, then it goes back to the drawing board, and, and I'm not ashamed to say that we've met you know we've done our due diligence um, so if we decide if that's what this board decides then so be it but um, as we you know I don't think we can deal with the pedestrian uh, access at this point that we just there's not enough information for us to deal with it okay. the only other condition I wanted to, to make sure we get in sure. here uh, if it does pass is to have a backup generator for the uh, uh, sanitary system to power campground during extended power outages. Yeah. Right. And we also talked about one to uh, make sure their literature talks about the kind of your idea of right, the, 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 the preferred chemicals and that the uh, camp store stock only the preferred chemicals. Well, let's let the let Rick and let Rick and Jeff catch up here a little bit. Yeah. I've got everything up to the chemical conditions. Not sure what, what the chemicals. I'm not sure how we phrase that, though. That's the only thing we don't know enough about the chemicals that are offered. Um, they've offered to be responsible. Well, okay. I, again, I'm fine with that. I think they're going to be responsible, and they understand. They think that they, uh, in their testimony, it, they are aware of the ones that are preferred and yeah, not preferred. Yeah. 
it, it's a frustrating one because there, the laws aren't in place, right. you know, and there's nothing we can do to right. to do that, that at this that point. But but, but I but I, I heard enough testimony that I'm comfortable with the uh, management practices of the potential campground owners that they will they will encourage and that. that. And they were good, they said carry it in their store. And you know I I, I hope that you know the laws get changed on a statewide or state by state basis that it would be nice if it was federal but you know we have a long way to go to get to that point um, uh, as we go down our list there's nothing regarding parking that becomes an issue I know there was some issues regarding landscaping on the interior portion of the uh, of the campground in regard to you know sites but I don't know on campgrounds that we can deal with interior landscaping. But I, it was also testified that they're going to have a very nice... Uh, I, I, I understand, but I, I just don't think, you know, I mean, I understand it would be great to have a place where you can pull in, but I think they're going to have to build it and see what type of landscaping they're going to need interior-wise. I don't think it's up to us to decide that. No. That was my point. Um, we dealt with hours, um, at least quiet hours, and I think that's that that is an adequate um, adequate condition uh, lighting um, you know lighting will always be an issue but I think we we've, we've come a long ways uh, from 20 years ago um, you know there's enough language I heard what Jeff said earlier so I was pleased to hear that from an enforcement standpoint so I think we're fine with the lighting end of it um, screening we spent a long time on that um, I don't think there needs to be anything else said regarding that. Um, increased setbacks, we certainly didn't talk about setbacks at all, and nor do I think we need to. Um, signs, we, uh, signs will be permitted by code, uh, both town, Jacksonport, and county, so we dealt with the one sign on the interior portion, but signs will be uh, dealt with. I don't think that there's an issue there for us. Is it 24? On premise signage is 24 square feet maximum. Right. Um, and then, as far as off premise signage along the highway is prohibited um, within the scenic byways area, which is essentially um, all of State Highway 57 and all of State Highway 42 north of the split near Sturgeon Bay, and uh, except for the town of Egg Harbor is not in that. Yeah. Um, Stormwater and building code, we, we certainly. Uh, dealt with all of that um, project completion date we dealt with that as well um, uh, one of the other things from my notes and I don't know if it's important um, you folks tell me if I should leave it alone one of the things I brought up in testimony one of the things that discourages me is we're well we're in a seasonal tourism area and we have a lot of campgrounds and when I drive by campgrounds uh, I in the off season, I think it, from a beautification standpoint, that you know if we can prohibit RVs and trailers from the site um, December through March, I think that's a reasonable approach because we kept camping into November and sometimes we start camping as early as April. And so I just don't think it's. I mean, unless you you folks feel that I'm overreaching. But I just don't think having RVs and trailers on the site from December through March is a good thing. Yeah, yeah and as I recall from the testimony, Lawrence said that they felt the same way. So sure. I don't think there's a problem putting that on there. That's agreed. Sounds good. Okay. But December through December through March. Right, because that would still give them the opportunity for those who are involved in cross country skiing or snowshoeing well, and snowmobiling. Yeah. For people to bring their Unit up. Yes. Well, there's no, there's no. Everything's above ground. Everything's plumbed and everything above ground. So it's not going to be operating. Just Nothing's so much to store the trailers there, which we don't want. There won't do. be any winter camping. That's no winter saying. camping. No winter camping. Okay. Um, Rick, Jeff, is there anything else that needs to be considered here? Just ask Jeff if he had the screening condition right. <laughs> I think so. One time. We did. Well, we, so we can just quick go through what the conditions were that we discussed here. So, from the Resource Planning Committee's original approval, uh, 
conditions number one through nine are entirely the same. Condition number 10 should be uh, amended to say a sign shall be installed near the campground exit stating no left turn on Tobago Road for safety reasons. In addition, the campground informational brochure, website, and any other print or digital media information regarding the campground shall contain the same rec safety recommendation. You didn't put the um, petitioning the town for uh, Edward Edwards? That, I put that as a completely separate condition, okay. um, and I'll get to that one at the end. Okay. Condition number 11 and 12 are exactly the same. Condition number 13 should read, <laughs> for the north property line, the tree shall be a minimum of four feet tall at the time of establishment and shall be placed no further than 10 feet apart. For the south property line, the tree shall be at least four feet tall at the time of establishment and shall be placed eight feet no, no greater than eight feet apart. Or per the tree supplier's recommendation, whichever spacing is less, but shall not be more than 10 feet apart. For the west property line, it shall be as per the ordinance standards, which is two foot tall <coughs> trees, spaced 10, no further than 10 feet apart. And then for the eastern property line, the tree shall be a minimum of four feet tall at the time of establishment. They shall be fast growing cedar trees and they shall be placed no further than eight feet apart as shown on the site plan or per the tree supplier's recommendation, whichever spacing is less. I think we used a certified arborist as opposed to a tree supplier. Correct. Um, correction, certified arborist as opposed to the tree supplier's recommendation. Thank you, Bob. And then conditions 14 through 16 were the same as uh, the Resource Planning Committee's conditions. And then the one last condition, or one additional condition that Bob brought up. Uh, is the owner shall petition the town to create an ordinance to enforce no left turns onto Bagno Road from the campground. Condition number 18: uh, No personal generators shall be allowed in the camp shall be allowed in the campground. Condition number 19 is there shall be a backup generator installed on the property. Condition number 21, or condition number 20 is RVs, trailers, slash campers shall be removed from the from the site December and shall not be stored on the site during the months of December through March. And then one last, the one last condition is if you can get that winery one up available. Well, we'll have to change the way. Yeah. The applicants shall request the Wisconsin Department of Transportation to review the proposed development and determine whether any improvements should be made to increase safety of the Bagnall Road and State Highway 57 intersection. The applicants shall provide documentation of the WDOT determination to the Door County Land Use Services Department. The applicants are responsible for the implementation slash, slash installation for, of any improvements recommended by the DOT, and the improvements shall be implemented slash installed before the campground is open to the public. And that is all the conditions that we discussed. Okay. Um, just a couple of things that um, I, I know um, I appreciate that we even talked about all of them. A couple of things that on my notes that we didn't talk about, um, and 
Um, let's see. We talked about the possibility uh, of necessity to screen propane tanks and or fence the propane tanks. I don't know that that's necessary. I, I struggle with that one. I, from a personal standpoint, I think it's a great idea, uh, but um, we don't, you know, we get to the point where we can't screen everything, and sometimes these things become redundant. Uh, we talked about um, fencing in the stormwater ponds. I, I, I think Peter Hurth testimony indicated that the, the stormwater ponds will have little or no water. And again, I don't know that it's necessary for us to address that one, but I just wanted to make sure that we talked because we certainly had testimony in, the, in regard to that. That would be the owner's uh, point. That if, if there's water in the detention ponds, the sign it. Sure, and, and, and I, would, I would think any responsible insurance carrier when they come on board if they find it necessary, those type of things are often addressed or recommended as well. I get recommendations from every year from my insurance carrier as I think many of you do as well. Um, we talked about, one thing we did talk about that uh, we didn't address and I think it just, I just saw it on my note. Um, we talked about having a requirement to install um, a dry hydrant, I believe the term was, and, and I think that might be a necessary one. Um, I, I do think that, I, if I recall testimony from the fire chief, that that would be helpful. Right. So I think perhaps we could add another condition that a dry hydrant be installed uh, on the, uh, at, the, at the proposed swimming pond right. for fire protection purposes. Anybody else feel di differently, or is that no, okay? Sounds, sounds like, it sounds okay. like an oxymoron, a dry hydrant. Well, I, I believe that's the term, though. I, I don't know if that's the correct term, but, you know. No, that is a correct term, yeah. because we have dry hydrant, hydrants in three pools. Uh, and, and I know I have and one. That's instantaneous water. I have one as well at my Marshall Point, de at our Marshall Point development. So but I think that's what they're called. Um, so how are the, those maintained over the winter? There, there's no maintenance on them. There's, yeah, no maintenance. I mean, like a dry yeah, there's screen to keep. Yeah, uh, yeah. Obviously, and it's a know pipe how that works. It's a pipe out of the ground mm -hmm. next to the pond. And they can fire, oh, so okay. fire protection can hook there's up. There's no pressure, no pressure yeah. or anything like that. And, no. and um, you know, one of the other things that, you know, we did talk about at great length, and I know Peter, um, and I think, Peter offered testimony in rebuttal, and I think John, you talked about it, was the ability to perhaps have holding tanks on this property rather than uh, sanitary, the design sanitary system. Uh, and I appreciated Peter's comments, and I appreciated your con your comments. Um, but one of the things that struck me, Peter had talked about, you know, pumper trucks coming and going, perhaps in and out of the property. But I, you know, when I thought about it some more, I, I, I understand what he's saying, but you're going to have soda and beer and wine delivery trucks and UPS trucks, et cetera. You're going to have trucks coming and going as well. Um, but I, I, that's not germane, but I just wanted to say that I appreciated the back and forth on all of that because I think it's important and um, it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how Door County progresses in regard to sanitary systems versus holding tanks to take the waste. To facilities, but we have what we have right now, and, right. and I think Peter certainly did a good job, you know, at least rebutting that. We didn't have any testimony from the plan or from uh, the Door County Sanitarian, but Peter worked closely with the Sanitarian to come up with this plan. So I think that's what we have. So I think we're okay with that. I, I don't know if there's any other conditions that need to be offered at this point. I'm pretty comfortable at this point, unless somebody else has something they want to add. Please review your notes and be comfortable. And Mr. Chairman, yeah. I have one yes. that has not been addressed yes. that is important. I would just like to see a plan in writing uh, on the Blackwater cleanup. Uh, it spills. Uh, as to how they see that's going to happen. 
because it does happen. When they're, when they're dumping their tanks before they leave and something goes awry, broken hose. But then they testify when they empty, there's a curbing area that automatically catches all that and channels it into the system? Well, if you go to Peninsula State Park, it's the ground. I know, but they testify that they, Pete said that they have a curbing system with hookup so where if, if there is a spillage, it, it automatically long, funnels. As long as it's put in in that language, I'm fine with that. You want that as a condition then? Yes. Well, Isn't it already part of the plan that's been approved? From what I understood, but it's it's part of the plan. I don't know if that'd be a requirement of the sanitary system approval. Um, I, I don't know exactly what that sanitary system approval that requires that curbing and. Uh, Shall we leave it? Leave in the sanitarians. Let's just say that they will consult with the sanitarian as far as. Oh, we need water. to check it out. Here I have what? one possible wording for a condition would be a cleanup plan slash mitigation plan for blackwater spills shall be submitted to our part the land use services department which includes the sanitary correct and the sanitarian is part of our department yeah sound good okay everybody else have an opportunity to review their notes Okay, um, we have a motion on the table to deny the appeal and grant the conditional use permit with the conditions attached. Is there all those in favor signify by saying aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. So the conditional uh, appeal has been denied and the conditional use permit has been granted by a vote of three to two. Okay. All right. Um, thank you all very much. Um, we have a couple of things on our agenda. Um, if you bear with me just a moment and please be quiet for just a moment. Um, I just have uh, other, other matters announced next meeting. Next meeting will be in June, Ooh, that was, that was <laughs> we, tried to, we tried to promise you that there wasn't going to be a meeting in May, but today is the first. Uh, the next meeting will be June 12th. We have one hearing scheduled for that meeting. Can we all check our calendars? And if you're not available, please let the planning department know. Okay? June 12th. June 12th. Okay? Well, we won't say anything else. And then item uh, 4.0 is vouchers. Um, we can work on vouchers. It'll take us a little while to work on vouchers. So um, I'm just going to adjourn and let the public leave okay, quietly. Sure. So and then. Uh, um, motion and second. Um, um, we adjourn? Second. Okay. Third. Fourth. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And then we can deal with vouchers here. Yeah. Thank you all very, very much. Um, as you can tell, the, the Board of Adjustment is uh, found this to be a very difficult case. Um, I hope that you all feel that you were served properly. And um, I hope that you can all work together to get the project done in, in a timely and responsible manner. Thank you all very much. Good luck. Good luck.